We often hear it said of some man that he just can't get himself together. What this means is that he is psychologically fragmented. Various parts of his personality are split off from each other. A man who cannot get it together is a man who has probably not had the opportunity to undergo ritual initiation into the deep structures of manhood. He remains a boy, not because he wants to, but because no one has shown him the way to transform his boy energies into man energies. No one has led him into direct and healing experiences of the inner world of the masculine potentials. It can be said that life's perhaps most fundamental dynamic is the attempt to move from a lower form of experience and consciousness to a higher or deeper level of consciousness, from a diffuse identity to a more consolidated and structured identity. All of human life at least attempts to move forward along these lines. We seek initiation into adulthood, into adult responsibilities and duties toward ourselves and others, into adult joys and adult rights, and into adult spirituality. Tribal societies had highly specific notions about adulthood, both masculine and feminine, and how to get to it. And they had ritual processes to enable their children to achieve what we would call calm, secure maturity. Our own culture has pseudo-rituals instead. There are many pseudo-initiations for men in our culture. Conscription into the military is one. The gangs of our major cities are another manifestation of pseudo-initiation. And so are the prison systems, which, in large measure, are run by gangs. We call these phenomena pseudo-events for two reasons. For one thing, with the possible exception of military initiation, these processes, though sometimes highly ritualized, more often than not initiate the boy into a kind of masculinity that is skewed, stunted, and false. It is a patriarchal manhood, one that is abusive of others and often of oneself. These pseudo-initiations will not produce men because real men are not wantonly violent or hostile. Boy psychology is charged with the struggle for dominance of others in some form or another, and it is often caught up in the wounding of self as well as of others. It is sadomasochistic. Man psychology is always the opposite. It is nurturing and generative, not wounding and destructive. In order for man psychology to come into being for any particular man, there needs to be a death. Death, symbolic, psychological, or spiritual, is always a vital part of any initiatory ritual. In psychological terms, the boy ego must die. The old ways of being and doing and thinking and feeling must ritually die before the new man can emerge. Pseudo-initiation often amplifies the ego's striving for power and control in a new form, an adolescent form regulated by other adolescents. Effective, transformative initiation slays the ego and its desires in its old form to resurrect it with a new subordinate relationship to a previously unknown power or center. Submission to the power of the mature masculine energies always brings forth a new masculine personality that is marked by calm, compassion, clarity of vision, and generativity. A second factor makes most initiations in our culture pseudo-initiations. In most cases, there is simply not a contained ritual process. Ritual process is contained by two things. The first is sacred space. In tribal societies, this space can be a specifically constructed hut or house in which the boys awaiting their initiation are held. It can be a cave, or it can be the vast wilderness into which the would-be initiate is driven 
in order to die or to find his manhood. The second essential ingredient for a successful initiatory process is the presence of a ritual elder. The ritual elder is the man who knows the secret wisdom, who knows the ways of the tribe and the closely guarded men's myths. He is the one who lives out of a vision of mature masculinity. With a scarcity in our culture of mature men, it goes without saying that ritual elders are in desperately short supply. Thus, pseudo-initiations remain skewed toward the reinforcement of boy psychology. The crisis in mature masculinity is very much upon us. Lacking adequate models of mature men and lacking the societal cohesion and institutional structures for actualizing ritual process, it's every man for himself. And most of us fall by the wayside with no idea what went wrong in our strivings. We just know we are anxious, on the verge of feeling impotent, helpless, frustrated, put down, unloved and unappreciated, often ashamed of being masculine. Many of us seek the generative, affirming, and empowering Father, though most of us don't know it. The Father who, for most of us, never existed in our lives and won't appear, no matter how hard we try to make Him appear. However, as students of human mythology and as Jungians, we believe there is good news. It's this good news for men, as well as for women, that we want to to share. Those of us who have been influenced by the thinking of the great Swiss psychologist Carl Jung have great reason to hope that the external deficiencies we have encountered in the world as would-be men, for instance, the absent father, the scarcity of ritual elders, can be corrected. And we have not only hope, but experience as clinicians and as individuals of inner resources not imagined by psychology before Jung. It is our experience that deep within every man are blueprints, what we can also call the hard wiring for the calm and positive, mature masculine. Jungians refer to these masculine potentials as archetypes, Jung and his successors have found that on the level of the deep unconscious, the psyche of every person is grounded in what Jung called the collective unconscious, made up of instinctual patterns and energy configurations probably inherited genetically throughout the generations of our species. These archetypes provide the very foundations of our behaviors our thinking, our feeling, and our characteristic human reactions. They are the image makers that artists and poets and religious prophets are so close to. Jung related them directly to the instincts in other animals. The existence of the archetypes is well documented by mountains of clinical evidence from the dreams and daydreams of patients and from careful observation of entrenched patterns of human behavior. It is also documented by in-depth studies of mythology the world over. Again and again we see the same essential figures appearing in folklore and mythology, and these just happen to appear also in the dreams of people who have no knowledge of these fields. The dying, resurrecting young God, for example, is found in the myths of such diverse peoples as Christians, Moslem Persians, ancient Sumerians, and modern Native Americans, as well as in the dreams of those undergoing psychotherapy. The evidence is great that there are underlying patterns that determine human cognitive and emotional life. These blueprints appear to be great in number, and they manifest themselves as both male and female. There are archetypes that pattern the thoughts and feelings and relationships of women, and there are archetypes that pattern the thoughts and feelings and relationships of men. In addition, Jungians have found that in every man there is a feminine subpersonality called the anima, made up of the feminine archetypes. 
and in every woman, there is a masculine subpersonality called the animus, made up of the masculine archetypes. All human beings can access the archetypes to a greater or lesser degree. We do this, in fact, in our interrelating with one another. This whole field is being actively discussed and continually revised as our knowledge about the inner instinctual human world moves forward. We are just beginning to sort out in a systematic way the inner human world that has always manifested itself to us in myth, ritual, dreams, and visions. The field of archetypal psychology is in its infancy. We want to show men how they can access these positive archetypal potentials for their own benefit and for the benefit of all those around them, maybe even for the planet. The drug dealer, the ducking and diving political leader, the wife beater, the chronically crabby boss, the hotshot junior executive, the unfaithful husband, the company yes-man, the indifferent graduate school advisor, the holier-than-thou minister, the gang member, the father who can never find the time to attend his daughter's school programs, the coach who ridicules his star athletes, the therapist who unconsciously attacks his clients shining and seeks a kind of gray normalcy for them, the yuppie. All these men have something in common. They are all boys pretending to be men. They got that way honestly because nobody showed them what a mature man is like. Their kind of manhood is a pretense to manhood that goes largely undetected as such by most of us. We are continually mistaking this man's controlling, threatening, and hostile behaviors for strength in reality. He is showing an underlying extreme vulnerability and weakness, the vulnerability of a wounded boy. The devastating fact is that most men are fixated at an immature level of development. These early developmental levels are governed by the inner blueprints appropriate to boyhood. When they are allowed to rule what should be adulthood, when the archetypes of boyhood are not built upon and transcended by the ego's appropriate accessing of the archetypes of mature masculinity, they cause us to act out of a boyishness that is hidden to us, but seldom to others. We often talk with affection about boyishness in our culture. The truth is that the boy in each of us, when he is in his appropriate place in our lives, is the source of playfulness, of pleasure, of fun, of energy, of a kind of open-mindedness that is ready for adventure and for the future. But there is another kind of boyishness that remains infantile in our interactions within ourselves and with others when manhood is required. Each of the archetypal energy potentials in the male psyche, in both its immature and its mature forms, has a three-part structure. At the top of the triangle is the archetype in its fullness. At the bottom of the triangle, the archetype is experienced in what we call a bipolar dysfunctional or shadow form. In both its immature and mature forms, that is, in both boy psychology and in man psychology terms, this bipolar dysfunction can be thought of as immature, in that it represents a psychological condition that is not integrated or cohesive. Lack of cohesion in the psyche is always a symptom of inadequate development, as the personality of the boy and then the man matures into its appropriate stage of development, the poles of these shadow forms become integrated and unified. Some boys seem more mature than others. They are accessing, no doubt unconsciously, the archetypes of boyhood more fully than are their peers. These boys have achieved a level of integration and inner unity that others have not. Other boys may seem more immature, even taking into account the natural immaturity of boyhood. For example, 
it is right for a boy to feel the heroic within himself, to see himself as a hero. But many boys cannot do this and become caught in the bipolar shadow forms of the hero, the grandstander bully, or the coward. Different archetypes come online at different developmental stages. The first archetype of the immature masculine to power up is the divine child. The precocious child and the Oedipal child are next, and the last stage of boyhood is governed by the hero. Human development does not always proceed so neatly, of course. There are mixtures of the archetypal influences all along the way. Interestingly, each of the archetypes of boy psychology gives rise in a complex way to each of the archetypes of mature masculinity. The boy is father to the man. Thus, the divine child, modulated and enriched by life's experiences, becomes the king. The precocious child becomes the magician. The Oedipal child becomes the lover, and the hero becomes the warrior. The four archetypes of boyhood, each with a triangular structure, can be put together to form a pyramid that depicts the structure of the boy's emerging identity, his immature masculine self. The same is true of the structure of the mature masculine self. As we have suggested, the adult man does not lose his boyishness, and the archetypes that form boyhood's foundation do not go away. Since archetypes cannot disappear, the mature man transcends the masculine powers of boyhood, building upon them rather than demolishing them. The resulting structure of the mature masculine self, therefore, is a pyramid over a pyramid. Though images should not be taken too literally, we are arguing that pyramids are universal symbols of the human self. The first, the most primal of the immature masculine energies is the divine child. We are all familiar with the Christian story of the birth of the baby Jesus. He is a mystery. He comes from the divine realm, born of a virgin woman. Miraculous things and events attend him. The star, the worshiping shepherds, the wise men from Persia. Surrounded by his worshipers, he occupies the central place, not only in the stable, but in the universe. Even the animals attend him. Because he is God, he is almighty. At the same time, he is totally vulnerable and helpless. No sooner is he born than the evil King Herod sniffs him out and seeks to kill him. He must be protected and spirited away to Egypt until he can be strong enough to begin his life's work and until the forces that would destroy him have spent their energy. This myth does not stand alone. The religions of the world are rich with stories of the miraculous baby boy. The Christian story itself is modeled in part on the story of the birth of the great Persian prophet Zoroaster, complete with miracles in nature, magi, and threats on his life. In Judaism, there is the story of the baby Moses, born to be the deliverer of his people, to be the great teacher and the mediator between God and human beings. He was raised as a prince of Egypt, and yet in his first days, his life was threatened by an edict from the Pharaoh, and he was placed, helpless and vulnerable, in a reed basket and set adrift on the Nile. The model for this story was the much older legend of the infancy of the great Mesopotamian king Sargon of Akkad. And from all over the world we hear legends about the wonderful infancy of the baby Buddha, the baby Krishna, the baby Dionysius, Less known is that this figure of the divine baby boy, universal in our religions, is also universal inside ourselves. This can be seen from the dreams of men in psychoanalysis, who frequently, especially as they start to get better, dream about a baby boy who fills the dream with light and joy and a sense of wonder and refreshment. Often, too, when a man in therapy starts to feel better, 
the urge comes to him, perhaps for the first time in his life, to have children. These events are signals that something new and creative, fresh and innocent, is being born within him. A new phase of his life is beginning. Creative parts of himself that he had been unconscious of are now thrusting upward into awareness. He is experiencing new life. But whenever the divine child within us makes itself known, attack from the Herods within and without is not far behind. New life, including new psychological life, is always fragile. When we feel this new energy manifesting within us, we need to move to protect it, because it is going to be attacked. Picking up on the theme in the Christmas story of the adoring animals and the angels' proclamation of peace on earth, we can see in the Greek myth of Orpheus that the divine child is the archetypal energy that prefigures the mature masculine energy of the king. The man-god Orpheus sits at the center of the world, playing his lyre and singing a song that brings all the animals of the forest to him. They are drawn by the song, prey and predator alike, and they come together around Orpheus in perfect harmony, their differences resolved, all of the opposites brought together into a world-transcending order, characteristic functions of the king, as we shall see. But this theme of the divine child bringing peace and order to the whole world, including the animal world, and animals looked at psychologically stand for our own often conflicting instincts, is not limited to ancient myths. A young man who had entered analysis once told us a story about an unusual event in his childhood. When he was probably five or six years old, he told us, he went out into his backyard one spring afternoon, yearning for something he was too young to identify, but that upon reflection later in life, he saw was a yearning for inner peace and harmony and a sense of oneness with all things. He stood with his back to a huge oak tree which grew in his yard, and he began to sing a song he made up as he went along. It was hypnotic for him. He sang his longing. He sang his sadness. And he sang a kind of minor key deep joy. He sang a song of compassion for all living things. It was a kind of self and other soothing lullaby, a song to the baby boy. And pretty soon he began to notice that birds were coming to the tree, a few at a time. He continued singing, and as he sang, more birds came, whirling and circling around the tree and alighting in its branches. At last the tree was filled with birds. It was alive with them. It seemed to him that they had been lured by the beauty and compassion of his song. They confirmed his beauty and answered his yearning by coming to adore him. The tree became a tree of life, and refreshed by this confirmation of his inner divine child, he could go on. The divine child archetype that appears in our myths as Orpheus, as Christ, as the infant Moses, and as various figures in the myths of many religions, in the dreams of men undergoing therapy, and in the actual experiences of boys, appears to be in the hardwiring of us all. We seem to be born with it. It goes by many names and is evaluated differently by the different schools of psychology. Usually, psychologists condemn it and, in effect, try to disconnect their clients from it. The important thing is to see that the divine child is built into us as a primal pattern of the immature masculine. For Jungians, this divine child within us is the source of life. It possesses magical, empowering qualities, and getting in touch with it produces an enormous sense of well-being, enthusiasm for life, and great peace and joy, as it did for the young boy under the oak tree. At the top of the triangular archetypal structure, we experience the divine child who renews us and keeps us young at heart. At the base of the triangle, we experience what we call the high chair tyrant and the weakling prince. The high chair tyrant is epitomized by the image of little Lord Fauntleroy sitting in his high chair, banging his spoon on the tray, and screaming for his mother to feed him kiss him, and attend him. Like a dark version of the Christ child, 
He is the center of the universe. Others exist to meet his all-powerful needs and desires, but when the food comes, it often does not meet his specifications. It's not good enough. It's not the right kind. It's too hot or too cold, too sweet or too sour. So he spits it on the floor or throws it across the room. If he becomes sufficiently self-righteous, no food, no matter how hungry he is, will be adequate. And if his mother picks him up after failing him so completely, he will scream and twist and reject her advances because they were not offered at exactly the right moment. The high chair tyrant hurts himself with his grandiosity, the limitlessness of his demands, because he rejects the very things he needs for life, food and love. Characteristics of the high chair tyrant include arrogance, what the Greeks called hubris or overweening pride, childishness in the negative sense, and irresponsibility even to himself as a mortal infant who has to meet his biological and psychological needs. All of this is what psychologists call inflation or pathological narcissism. The high chair tyrant needs to learn that he's not the center of the universe and that the universe does not exist to fulfill his every need, or better put, his limitless needs, his pretensions to Godhead. It will nurture him, but not in his form as God. The high chair tyrant through the shadow king may continue to be a ruling archetypal influence in adulthood. We all know the story of the promising leader, the CEO or presidential candidate, who starts to rise to great prominence and then shoots himself in the foot. He sabotages his success and crashes to the earth. The ancient Greeks said that hubris is always followed by nemesis. The gods always bring down those mortals who get too arrogant, demanding, or inflated. Icarus, for example, made wings of feathers and wax in order to fly like the birds, read, gods. And then in his inflation and against his father's warning, flew too close to the sun. The sun melted the wax, the wings disintegrated, and he plummeted into the sea. We are familiar with the saying, power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. King Louis XVI of France lost his head because of his arrogance. Often as we men rise in the corporate structure, as we gain more and more authority and power, the risk of self-destruction also rises. The boss who wants only yes men, who doesn't want to know what's going on, the president who doesn't want to hear his general's advice, the school principal who can't tolerate criticism from his teachers, all are men possessed by the high chair tyrant riding for a fall. The high chair tyrant who attacks his human host is the perfectionist. He expects the impossible of himself and berates himself, just as his mother did, when he can't meet the demands of the infant within. The tyrant pressures a man for more and better performance and is never satisfied with what he produces. The unfortunate man becomes the slave, as the mother was, of the grandiose two-year-old inside him. He has to have material things. He can't make mistakes. And because he can't possibly meet the demands of the inner tyrant, he develops ulcers and gets sick. He can't, in the end, stand up to this unrelenting pressure. We men often deal with the tyrant by finally having a heart attack. We go on strike against him. Finally, the only way to escape the little lord is to die. When the high chair tyrant cannot be brought under control, he will manifest in a Stalin, Caligula, or Hitler, all malignant sociopaths. It has been said that the divine child wants just to be and to have all things flow toward him. He does not want to do. The artist wants to be admired without having to lift a finger. The CEO wants to sit in his office enjoying his perks, but he does not want to do anything for the company. He imagines himself invulnerable and all-important. He often demeans and degrades others who are trying to accomplish something. He is in his high chair, and he's setting himself up to get the axe. The other side of the bipolar shadow of the divine child is the weakling prince. The boy, 
and later the man who is possessed by the weakling prince, appears to have very little personality, no enthusiasm for life, and very little initiative. This is the boy who needs to be coddled, who dictates to those around him by his silence or his whining and complaining helplessness. He needs to be carried around on a pillow. Everything is too much for him. He rarely joins in children's games. He has few friends. He doesn't do well in school. He's frequently hypochondriacal. His slightest wish is his parents' command. The entire family system revolves around his comfort. He reveals the dishonesty of his helplessness, however, in his dagger-like verbal assaults on his siblings, his biting sarcasm against them, and his patent manipulation of their feelings. Because he has convinced his parents that he is a helpless victim of life and that others are picking on him, when a controversy arises between himself and a sibling, his parents tend to punish the sibling and excuse him. The weakling prince is the polar opposite of the high chair tyrant, and though he rarely throws the tantrums of the tyrant, he nonetheless occupies a less easily detectable throne. As is the case with all bipolar disorders, the ego possessed by one pole will, from time to time, gradually slide or suddenly jump over to the other pole. When such a reversal occurs in the boy caught in the bipolar shadow of the divine child, he will switch from tyrannical outburst to depressed passivity, or from apparent weakness to rageful displays. In order to access the divine child appropriately, we need to acknowledge him, but not identify with him. We need to love and admire the creativity and beauty of this primal aspect of the masculine self, because if we don't have this connection with him, we are never going to see the possibilities in life. We are never going to seize opportunities for newness and freshness. Therapists often depreciate the grandiose self within their clients. Although it is necessary at times for clients to gain emotional and cognitive distance from the divine child, we ourselves have not encountered many men, at least among those who seek therapy, who identify with their creativity. Rather, they usually need to get in touch with it. We want to encourage greatness in men. We want to encourage ambition. We believe that nobody really wants to be sort of gray normal. Often, the definition of normal is average. We live, it seems to us, in an age under the curse of normalcy, characterized by the elevation of the mediocre. It seems likely that therapists who persistently depreciate the shining of the grandiose self in their clients are themselves split off from their own divine child. They are envying the beauty and freshness, the creativity and vitality of the child in their clients. The ancient Romans believed that every human baby is born with what they called his or her genius, a guardian spirit assigned at birth. Roman birthday parties were held not so much to honor an individual as to honor that person's genius, the divine being that came into the world with him or her. The Romans knew that it was not the man's ego that was the source of his music, his art, his statecraft, or his courageous deeds. It was the divine child, an aspect of the self within him. We need to ask ourselves two questions. The first one is not whether we are manifesting the high chair tyrant or the weakling prince, but how, because we are all manifesting both to some extent and in some form. At the very least, we all do this when we regress into our child, when we are fatigued or extremely frightened. The second question is not whether the creative child exists in us, but how we are honoring him or not honoring him. If we're not feeling him in our personal lives and in our work, then we have to ask ourselves how we are blocking him. The archetype of the precocious child manifests in a boy when he is eager to learn, 
when his mind is quickened, when he wants to share what he is learning with others. There's a glint in his eye and an energy of body and mind that shows he is adventuring in the world of ideas. This boy, and later the man, wants to know the why of everything. He asks his parents, why is the sky blue? Why do the leaves fall? Why do things have to die? He wants to know the how of things, the what and the where. He often learns to read at an early age so that he can answer his own questions. He's usually a good student and an eager participant in class discussions. Often this boy is also talented in one or more areas. He may be able to draw and paint well or play a musical instrument with proficiency. He may also be good at sports. The precocious child is the source of so-called child prodigies. The precocious child is the origin of our curiosity and our adventurous impulses. He urges us to be explorers and pioneers of the unknown, the strange and mysterious. He causes us to wonder at the world around us and the world inside of us. A boy for whom the precocious child is a powerful influence wants to know what makes other people tick as well as what makes himself tick. He wants to know why people act the way they do, why he has the feelings he has. He tends to be introverted and reflective, and he is able to see the hidden connections in things. He can achieve cognitive detachment from the people around him long before his peers are able to accomplish this. Though introverted and reflective, he is also extroverted and eagerly reaches out to others to share his insights and his talents with them. The precocious child in a man keeps his sense of wonder and curiosity alive, stimulates his intellect, and moves him in the direction of the mature magician. The bipolar shadow of the precocious child, like all the shadow forms of the archetypes of the immature masculine, can be carried over into adulthood, where it causes would-be men to manifest inappropriate infantilism in their thoughts, feelings, and behaviors. The know-it-all trickster is, as the name implies, that immature masculine energy that plays tricks of a more or less serious nature in one's own life and on others. He is expert at creating appearances and then selling us on those appearances. He seduces people into believing him and then he pulls the rug out from under them. He gets us to believe in him, to trust him, and then he betrays us and laughs at our misery. He is the practical joker, adept at making fools of us. He is a manipulator. The know-it-all is that aspect of the trickster in a boy or man that enjoys intimidating others. The boy or man, under the power of the know-it-all, shoots off his mouth a lot. He's always got his hand up in class, not because he wants to participate in the discussion, but because he wants his classmates to understand that he is more intelligent than they are. The boy or man, under the power of the know-it-all, makes many enemies. He is verbally abusive of others, whom he regards as his inferiors. As a result, in grade school, he can often be found on the bottom of a pile of angry boys who are whacking away at him. He comes away from these encounters with black eyes, but with a defiant conviction of his own superiority. The know-it-all man, who is still possessed by this infantile shadow form of the precocious child, is characteristically smug and often wears a cocky grin. He frequently dominates conversations, turning friendly discussions into lectures and arguments into diatribes. He depreciates those who don't know what he knows or who hold opinions that differ from his. Because the trickster is the umbrella complex under which the know-it-all operates, the man caught in this infantile influence is usually deceiving others, and perhaps himself as well, about the depth of his knowledge or the level of his importance. But he also has a positive side. He is very good at deflating egos, our own and those of others, and often we need deflating. 
He can spot in an instant when and in exactly what way we are inflated and identified with our own grandiosity, and he goes for it in order to reduce us to human size and expose to us all our frailties. How does the trickster work? Let's say you are preparing to give what you regard as the most brilliant presentation of your life. You're so proud of your special insights. You sit down at the computer and order it to print out the notes you had put into it earlier, and the printer doesn't work. Your own inner trickster has tricked you. Or you're going to make an appearance at an important function. You're timing it so that you know everyone will be waiting for you just for a few minutes, just long enough for them to realize how important you are. You go to the car at last, preparing to make your triumphal journey, and you can't find your keys. There they are, locked in the car, still in the ignition. Hubris leads to nemesis. This is how the trickster works against us, and in the long run, perhaps, for us. But he works through us against others, too. Maybe you're the practical joker, mercilessly hounding others with your pranks until someone does you one better and you are forced to realize how much it hurts. We need to understand this immature energy. Though its purpose in its positive mode seems to be to expose lies, if it is left unchecked, it moves into its negative side and becomes destructive of oneself and others. For the negative side of this immature masculine energy is really hostile and depreciating of all the real effort, all the rights, all the beauty of others. The trickster, like the high chair tyrant, does not want to do anything himself. He does not want to honestly earn anything. He just wants to be, and to be what he has no right to be. He is, in psychological language, passive-aggressive. This is the energy form that seeks the fall of great men, that delights in the destruction of a man of importance. But the trickster does not want to replace the man who has fallen. He does not want to take up that man's responsibilities. In fact, he doesn't want any responsibilities. He wants to do just enough to wreck things for others. The trickster causes a boy or a boyish man, to have an authority problem. Such a boy or man can always find a man to hate him and eventually shoot him down. He will readily believe that all men in power are corrupt and abusive. Like the man possessed by the weakling prince, he is condemned forever to be on the outskirts of life, never able to take responsibility for himself or his actions. His energy comes from envy. The less a man is in touch with his true talents and abilities, the more he will envy others. If we envy a lot, we are denying our own realistic greatness, our own divine child. What we need to do then is to get in touch with our own specialness, our own beauty, and our own creativity. Envy blocks creativity. The trickster is the archetype that rushes in to fill the vacuum in the immature man or boy left by the boy's denial of and lack of connection with the divine child. The trickster gets activated developmentally within us when we have been depreciated and attacked by our parents or older siblings or when we have been emotionally abused. If we don't feel our real specialness, we will come under the power of the trickster, the know-it-all, and deflate others' sense of their specialness even when such deflation is not called for. The know-it-all trickster has no heroes because to have heroes is to admire others. We can only admire others if we have a sense of our own worthiness and a developing sense of security about our own creative energies.
The boy or man who is under the power of the other pole of the dysfunctional shadow of the precocious child, the naive dummy, like the weakling prince, lacks personality, vigor, and creativity. He seems unresponsive and dull. He can't seem to learn his multiplication tables, count change or tell time. He is frequently labeled a slow learner. In addition, he lacks a sense of humor and frequently seems to miss the point of jokes. He may appear to be physically inept as well. His coordination is off, so he often becomes the butt of ridicule and contempt when he fumbles the ball on the playing field or strikes out in the last of the ninth. This boy may also appear to be naive. He is, or seems to be, the last kid on the block to learn about the birds and the bees. The dummy's ineptitude, however, is frequently less than honest. He may grasp far more than he shows, and his dunce-like behavior may mask a hidden grandiosity that feels itself too important as well as too vulnerable to come into the world. Thus, intimately intertwined with a secret know-it-all, the dummy is also a trickster. All the immature masculine energies are overly tied, one way or another, to mother, and are deficient in their experience of the nurturing and mature masculine. Although the boy for whom the Oedipal child is a powerful archetypal influence may be deficient in his experience of the nurturing masculine, he is able to access the positive qualities of the archetype. He is passionate and has a sense of wonder and a deep appreciation for connectedness with his inner depths, with others, and with all things. He is warm, related, and affectionate. He also expresses, through his experience of connectedness to the mother, the primal relationship for almost all of us, the origins of what we call spirituality. His sense of the mystic oneness and mutual communion of all things comes out of his deep yearning for the infinitely nurturing, infinitely good, infinitely beautiful mother. This mother is not his real mother, his mortal mother. She is bound to disappoint him much of the time in his need for connectedness and perfect or infinite love and nurturing. Rather, the mother that he is sensing beyond his own, beyond all the beauty and feeling which the Greeks called eros in the things of the world, and that he is experiencing in the deep feelings and images of his inner life, is the great mother, the goddess in her many forms and the myths and legends of many peoples and cultures. The Oedipal child's shadow consists of the mama's boy and the dreamer. The mama's boy is, as we all know, tied to mama's apron strings. He causes the boy to fantasize about marrying his mother, about taking her away from his father. If there is no father or a weak father... This so-called Oedipal urge comes on all the stronger, and this crippling side of the Oedipal child's bipolar shadow may possess him. The term Oedipus complex comes from Freud, who saw in the legend of the Greek king Oedipus a mythological account of this immature masculine energy form. The story is familiar. King Laertes and his wife Jocasta had a baby boy whom they named Oedipus. Because of a prophecy that said that Oedipus would grow up to kill his father, Laertes had this special child taken out into the country and exposed on a hillside, where it was assumed the elements would kill him. However, as is always the case with divine boys, Oedipus was rescued. He was found by a shepherd and raised to manhood. One day, as Oedipus was walking down a country road, a chariot nearly ran him down. He got into a fight with the owner of the chariot and killed him. The chariot's owner, unbeknownst to him, was his father Laertes. Oedipus then went on to Thebes, where he learned that the queen was seeking a husband. The queen was Jocasta, his mother. Oedipus married her and took his father's throne. It was only years later when blight descended upon the kingdom that the awful truth was uncovered and Oedipus the wrongful king, 
was cast down. The underlying psychological truth in the story is that Oedipus was inflated. He was struck down by the gods for killing his father, the god, and marrying his mother, the goddess. Thus he was destroyed for the unconscious inflation of his unconscious pretensions to godhood. For every child, from a developmental point of view, mother is the goddess and father is the god. Boys who are too bound to the mother get hurt. There's also the story of Adonis, who became the lover of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. A mortal boy making claims on a goddess could not be tolerated, so Adonis was struck down by a wild boar, really a god in animal form, the father, and killed. Something else happens to the mama's boy. He often gets caught up in chasing the beautiful, the poignant, the yearning for union with mother from one woman to another. He can never be satisfied with a mortal woman because what he is seeking is the immortal goddess. Here we have the Don Juan syndrome. The Oedipal child, inflated beyond mortal dimensions, cannot be bound to one woman. In addition, the boy under the power of the mama's boy is what is called autoerotic. He may compulsively masturbate, he may be into pornography, seeking the goddess in the nearly infinite forms of the female body. The mama's boy, like all immature energies, wants just to be. He does not want to do what it takes to actually have union with a mortal woman and to deal with all the complex feelings involved in an intimate relationship. He does not want to take responsibility. The other pole of the dysfunctional shadow of the Oedipal child is the dreamer. The dreamer takes the spiritual impulses of the Oedipal child to an extreme. Whereas the boy possessed by the mama's boy also shows signs of passivity, he at least actively seeks mother. The dreamer, however, causes a boy to feel isolated and cut off from all human relationships. For the boy who is under the spell of the dreamer, Relationships are with intangible things and with the world of the imagination within him. As a consequence, while other children are playing, he may sit on a rock dreaming his dreams. He accomplishes little and appears withdrawn and depressed. Often his dreams tend to be melancholy on the one hand or highly idyllic and ethereal on the other. The boy possessed by the dreamer, like a boy possessed by some of the other shadow poles, is less than honest, though his dishonesty is usually unconscious. His isolated, ethereal behavior may mask the hidden and opposite pole of the Oedipal child's shadow, the mama's boy. What this boy really shows in a roundabout way is his peak at failing to achieve possession of the mother. His grandiosity in seeking to possess the mother is hidden by the dreamer's depression. There is much confusion about the archetype of the hero. It is generally assumed that the heroic approach to life or to a task is the noblest, but this is only partly true. The hero is, in fact, only an advanced form of boy psychology, the most advanced form, the peak, actually, of the masculine energies of the boy, the archetype that characterizes the best in the adolescent stage of development. Yet it is immature, and when it is carried over into adulthood as the governing archetype, it blocks men from full maturity. If we think about the hero as the grandstander or the bully, this negative aspect becomes clearer. The boy or man under the power of the bully intends to impress others. His strategies are designed to proclaim his superiority and his right to dominate those around him. He claims center stage as his birthright. If ever his claims to special status are challenged, watch the ensuing rageful displays. He will assault those who question what they smell as his inflation with vicious verbal and often physical abuse. These attacks against others are aimed at staving off recognition of his underlying cowardice and his deep insecurity. The man still under the influence of this negative aspect of the hero is not a team player. 
He is a loner. He's a hotshot junior executive, salesman, revolutionary, stock market manipulator. He's the soldier who takes unnecessary risks in combat, and if he's in a position of leadership, requires the same of his men. The man who is possessed by the grandstander bully pole of the hero shadow has an inflated sense of his own importance and his own abilities. The hero begins by thinking that he is invulnerable, that only the impossible dream is for him, and that he can fight the unbeatable foe and win. But if the dream really is impossible, and if the foe really is unbeatable, then the hero is in for trouble. The sense of invulnerability, a manifestation of the grandstander bully and of the godlike pretensions of all these immature masculine energy forms, leaves the man under the influence of the shadow hero open to the danger of his own demise. Finally, he will shoot himself in the foot. The heroic General George Patton, though immensely imaginative, creative, and inspiring to his troops, at least at times sabotaged himself with his risk-taking, his immature competition with the British General Montgomery, and his insightful but boyishly brash remarks. Rather than being assigned a mission for which his true talent qualified him, to head the Allied invasion of Europe, for instance, he was sidelined precisely because he was a hero and not fully a warrior. As is the case with the other immature masculine archetypes, the hero is overly tied to the mother. But the hero has a driving need to overcome her. He is locked in mortal combat with the feminine striving to conquer it and to assert his masculinity. In the medieval legends about heroes and damsels, we are seldom told what happens once the hero has slain the dragon and married the princess. We don't hear what happened in their marriage because the hero, as an archetype, doesn't know what to do with the princess once he's won her. He doesn't know what to do when things return to normal. The hero's downfall is that he doesn't know and is unable to acknowledge his own limitations. A boy or a man under the power of the shadow hero cannot really realize that he is a mortal being. Denial of death, the ultimate limitation on human life, is his specialty. In this connection, we might think for a moment about the heroic nature of our Western culture. Its main business seems to be as is often said, the conquest of nature, its use and manipulation. Pollution and environmental catastrophe are the increasingly obvious penalties for such a brash and immature project. The field of medicine operates on the usually unspoken assumption that disease and eventually death itself can be eliminated. Our modern world view has serious difficulty facing human limitations. When we do not face our true limitations, we are inflated, and sooner or later our inflation will be called to account. The boy possessed by the coward, the other pole of the hero's bipolar shadow, shows an extreme reluctance to stand up for himself in physical confrontations. He will usually run away from a fight, perhaps excusing himself by claiming that it's more manly to walk away but he will feel wretched in spite of his excuses. It is not only physical fights he will avoid, however. He will tend to allow himself to be bullied emotionally and intellectually as well. When someone else is demanding or forceful with him, the boy under the power of the coward and unable to feel heroic about himself will cave in. He will easily acquiesce to pressure from others. He will feel invaded and run over like a doormat. When he's had enough of this, however, the hidden grandiosity of the grandstander bully within him will erupt and launch a violent verbal and or physical assault upon his enemy, an assault for which the other is totally unprepared. But having described the negative or shadow aspects of the grandstander and the coward, we nonetheless have to ask ourselves why the hero is present in our psyches at all. Why is this a part of our personal developmental history as men? What is the evolutionary adaptation that it serves? What the hero does is mobilize the boy's delicate ego structures 
to break with the mother at the end of boyhood and face the difficult task that life is beginning to assign him. The hero energies call upon the boy's masculine reserves, which will be refined as he matures, in order to establish his independence and his competence and test himself against the difficult, even hostile forces in the world. The hero enables him to establish a beachhead against the overwhelming power of the subconscious, much of which, for men at least, is experienced as feminine, as mother. The hero enables the boy to begin to assert himself and define himself as distinct from all others, so that ultimately, as a distinct being, he can relate to them fully and creatively. The hero throws the boy up against the limits, against the seemingly intractable. It encourages him to dream the impossible dream that might just be possible after all if he has enough courage. It empowers him to fight the unbeatable foe that if he is not possessed by the hero, he might just be able to defeat. Once again, it is our position that all too often therapists, not to mention relatives, friends, co-workers, and people in positions of authority, attack, knowingly or unknowingly, the shining of the hero in men. Ours is an age of envy, in which laziness and self-involvement are the rule. Anyone who dares to stand above the crowd is dragged back down by his lackluster peers. We need a great rebirth of the heroic in our world. Every sector of human society, wherever that may be on the planet, seems to be slipping into chaos. Only a massive rebirth of courage in both men and women will rescue the world. Against enormous odds, the hero picks up his sword and charges into the heart of the abyss, into the mouth of the dragon, into the castle under the power of an evil spell. What is the end of the hero? Almost universally, in legend and myth, he dies, is transformed into a god and translated into heaven. We recall the story of Jesus' resurrection and ascension, or of Oedipus' final disappearance in a flash of light at Colonus, or Elijah's ascent into the sky in a fiery chariot. The death of the hero is the death of boyhood, of boy psychology, and it is the birth of manhood and man psychology. The death of the hero in the life of a boy or a man really means that he has finally encountered his limitations. He has met the enemy, and the enemy is himself. He has met his own dark side, his very unheroic side. He has fought the dragon and been burned by it. He has fought the revolution and drunk the dregs of his own inhumanity. He has overcome the mother and then realized his incapacity to love the princess. The death of the hero signals a boy's or a man's encounter with true humility. It is the end of his heroic consciousness. True humility, we believe, consists of two things. The first is knowing our limitations, and the second is getting the help we need. If we are possessed by the hero, we will fall under the negative aspect of this energy and live out the inflated feelings and actions of the grandstander bully. We will walk over others in our insensitivity and arrogance, and eventually we will self-destruct, ridiculed, and cast out by others. If we are in the passive pole of the hero's bipolar shadow, possessed by the coward, we will lack the motivation to achieve anything of significance for human life. But if we access the hero energy appropriately, we will push ourselves up against our limitations. We will adventure to the frontiers of what we can be as boys, and from there, if we can make the transition, we will be prepared for our initiation into manhood. It is enormously difficult for a human being to develop to full potential. The struggle with the infantile within us exerts a tremendous gravitational pull against achieving that full adult potential. Nevertheless, we need to fight gravity by dint of hard labor, 
and to build the pyramids of first boyhood and then manhood that constitute the core structures of our masculine selves. The ancient Maya seldom destroyed earlier structures from their city's past. Like them, we do not want to demolish the pyramids of boyhood, for they were and will always remain generators of power and gateways to energy resources from our primordial past. But we need to get to work laying courses of stone over those old terraces and stairs. We need to build brick by brick toward the goal of mature masculinity. There are a number of techniques we can use in this construction project. Analysis of dreams, the re-entering and changing of our dreams, active imagination in which the ego, among other things, dialogues with the energy patterns within, thereby achieving both differentiation from and access to them, psychotherapy in a variety of forms, meditation on the positive aspects of the archetypes, prayer, magical ritual process with a spiritual elder, various forms of spiritual discipline and other methods are all important to the difficult process of turning boys into men. The four major forms of the mature masculine energies that we have identified are the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover. They all overlap and ideally enrich each other. A good king is always also a warrior, a magician, and a lover, and the same holds true for the other three. The boy energies also overlap and inform each other, as we've seen. The divine child naturally gives rise to the Oedipal child. Together they form the nucleus of whatever will be beautiful, energetic, related, warm, caring, and spiritual in the man. The boy's ego needs the precocious child's perceptiveness to help it distinguish itself from these energies. And all three give rise to the hero, which breaks them free of the domination of the feminine unconscious and establishes the boy's identity as a separate individual. The hero prepares the boy to become a man. The archetypes are mysterious entities or energy flows. They remain hidden but we experience their effects in art, in poetry, in music, in religion, in our scientific discoveries, in our patterns of behavior and of thought and feeling. We can see something of the shapes and patterns of the archetypes through these manifestations, but we can never see the energies themselves. They overlap and interpenetrate one another, yet they can be distinguished from one another for purposes of clarification. Through active imagination, they can be remixed so that we can realize the desired balance among their influences in our own lives. Man psychology, as we have suggested, has perhaps always been a rare thing on our planet. It is certainly a rare thing today. The horrible physical and psychological circumstances under which most human beings have lived most places most of the time are staggering. Hostile environments always lead to the stunting, twisting, and mutating of an organism. Let us frankly admit the enormous difficulty of our situation, for it is only when we allow ourselves to see the seriousness of any problem and to admit what it is we are up against that we can begin to take appropriate action, action that will be life-enhancing for us and for others. There's a saying in psychology that we have to take responsibility for what we're not responsible for. This means that we are not responsible, as no infant is, for what happened to us to stunt us and to fixate us in our early years when our personalities were formed and when we got stuck at immature levels of masculinity. Yet it does us no good to leave things at that. Ours is a psychological age rather than an institutional one. What used to be done for us by institutional structures and through ritual process, we now have to do inside ourselves, for ourselves. Ours is a culture of the individual rather than the collective.
Our Western civilization pushes us to strike out on our own, to become, as Jung said, individuated from each other. That which used to be more or less unconsciously shared by everyone, like the process of developing a mature masculine identity, we now must connect with consciously and individually. It is to this task that we now turn. The king energy is primordial in all men. It bears the same relationship to the other three mature masculine potentials as the divine child does to the other three immature masculine energies. It comes first in importance, and it underlies and includes the rest of the archetypes in perfect balance. The good and generative king is also a good warrior, a positive magician, and a great lover. And yet, with most of us, the king comes online last. We could say that the king is the divine child, but seasoned and complex, wise and in a sense as selfless as the divine child is cosmically self-involved. Whereas the divine child, especially in his aspect as the high chair tyrant, has infantile pretensions to godhood, the king archetype comes close to being God in his masculine form within every man. In many ways, the king energy is father energy. It is our experience, however, that although the king underlies the father archetype, as Freud defined it, it is more extensive and more basic than the father. Historically, kings have always been sacred. As mortal men, however, they have been relatively unimportant. It is the kingship or the king energy itself that has been important. As Sir James Frazier and others have observed, kings in the ancient world were often ritually killed when their ability to live out the king archetype began to fail. What was important was that the generative power of the energy not be tied to the fate of an aging and increasingly impotent mortal. With the raising up of the new king, the king energy was re-embodied, and the king as archetype was renewed in the lives of the people of the realm. In fact, the whole world was renewed. This pattern, the ritual killing and reviving, is what lies behind the Christian story of the death and resurrection of Christ, the Savior King. Earlier we said that the death of the archetypes of boyhood, and especially of the hero, was the birth of the man, that the end of boy psychology is the beginning of man psychology. Two functions of king energy make this transition from boy psychology to man psychology possible. The first of these is ordering. The second is the providing of fertility and blessing. Like the divine child, the good king is at the center of the world. He sits on his throne on the central mountain, or on the primeval hill, as the ancient Egyptians called it. And from this central place, all of creation radiates in geometrical form out to the very frontiers of the realm. World is defined as that part of reality that is organized and ordered by the king. What is outside the boundaries of his influence is non-creation, chaos, the demonic, and non-world. In conjunction with his ordering function, the second vital good that the king energy manifests is fertility and blessing. As the mortal king went, so did the realm, both its order and fertility. If the king was lusty and vigorous sexually, the land would be vital. If he stayed healthy and strong, the crops would grow, the cattle would reproduce, the merchants would prosper, and many babies would be born to his people. Always, the king's culminating ordering generative act was to marry the land in the form of his primary queen. It was only in creative partnership with her that he could assure every kind of bounty for his kingdom. It was the royal couple's duty to pass their creative energies on to the kingdom in the form of children. The kingdom would mirror the royal generativity, which, let us remember, was at the center. 
As the center was, so would be the rest of creation. When a king became sick or weak or impotent, the kingdom languished. The rains did not come. The crops did not grow. The cattle did not reproduce. Drought would assault the land, and the people would perish. So the king was the earthly conduit from the divine world, the world of the king energy, to this world. He was the mediator between the mortal and the divine. He was the central artery, we might say, that allowed the blood of the life force to flow into the human world. It was not only fertility in an immediately physical sense or generativity and creativity in a general sense that came out of the second function of the king energy through the efficacy of ancient kings. It was also blessing. Blessing is a psychological or spiritual event. The good king always mirrored and affirmed those others who deserved it. He did this by seeing them in a literal sense, in his audiences at the palace, and in the psychological sense of noticing them, knowing them in their true worth. He held audience primarily not to be seen, but to see, admire, and delight in his subjects, to reward them, and to bestow honors upon them. Being blessed has tremendous psychological consequences for us, there are even studies that show that our bodies actually change chemically when we feel valued, praised, and blessed. Young men today are starving for blessing from older men, starving for blessing from the king energy. This is why they cannot, as we say, get it together. They need to be blessed. They need to be seen by the king because if they are, something inside will come together for them. That is the effect of blessing. It heals and makes whole. That's what happens when we are seen and valued for our legitimate talents and abilities. Of course, many ancient kings, like many men in kingly positions today, fell far short of the ideal image of the good king. Yet this central archetype lives on independently of any one of us and seeks, through us, to come into our lives in order to consolidate, create, and bless. What can we say are the characteristics of the good king? Based on ancient myths and legends, what are the qualities of this mature masculine energy? The king archetype in its fullness possesses the qualities of order, of reasonable and rational patterning, of integration and integrity in the masculine psyche. It gives stability and centeredness. It brings calm. It brings maintenance and balance. It defends our own sense of inner order, our integrity of being and of purpose, our essential certainty in our masculine identity. It looks upon the world with a firm but kindly eye. It sees others in all their weaknesses and in all their talent and worth. It guides them and nurtures them toward their own fullness of being. It rewards and encourages creativity in us and in others. In its central incorporation and expression of the warrior... It represents aggressive might when that is what is needed when order is threatened. It also has the power of inner authority. This is the energy that seeks peace and stability, orderly growth and nurturing for all people, and not only for all people, but for the environment, the natural world. The king cares for the whole realm and is the steward of nature as well as of human society. This is the energy manifested in ancient myths of the shepherd of his people and of the gardener and husbandman of the plants and animals in the kingdom. This is the voice that affirms the human rights of all, that minimizes punishment and maximizes praise. This is the voice from the center, the primeval hill within every man.
Though most of us have experienced some of this energy of the mature masculine in our lives, perhaps within ourselves in moments when we felt very well integrated, calm and centered, most of us have to confess that we have experienced very little of the king energy in its fullness. We may have felt it in bits and pieces, but the sad fact is that this positive energy is disastrously lacking in the lives of most men. Mostly what we have experienced is what we are calling the shadow king. As in the case of all the archetypes, the king displays an active, passive, bipolar shadow structure. We call the active pole of the shadow king the tyrant and the passive pole the weakling. We can see the tyrant acting in the Christian story of the birth of Jesus. Soon after the Christ child is born, King Herod discovers the fact. He sends his soldiers to Bethlehem looking for the new king to kill it. Because Jesus is the divine child, he gets away in time but Herod's soldiers kill every male child left in the town. Whenever the new is born, the Herod within us and in our outer lives will attack. The tyrant hates, fears, and envies new life because that new life, he senses, is a threat to his slim grasp on his own kingship. The tyrant king is not in the center and does not feel calm and generative. He is not creative, but only destructive. If he were secure in his own generativity and in his own inner order, his self-structures, he would react with delight at the birth of new life in his realm. The tyrant exploits and abuses others. He is ruthless, merciless, and without feeling when he is pursuing what he thinks is his own self-interest. His degradation of others knows no bounds. He hates all beauty, all innocence, all strength, all talent, all life energy. He does so because, as we've said, he lacks inner structure, and he is afraid, terrified, really, of his own hidden weakness and his underlying lack of potency. It is the shadow king as tyrant in the father who makes war on his sons and his daughters joy and newness of being and the life force surging through them, and he seeks to kill it. He does this with open verbal assaults and deprecation of their interests, hopes, and talents, or he does it alternately by ignoring their accomplishments, turning his back on their disappointments, and registering boredom and lack of interest when, for instance, they come home from school and present him with a piece of artwork or a good grade on a test. His attacks may not be limited to verbal or psychological abuse. Spankings may turn into beatings, and there may be sexual assaults as well. The father possessed by the tyrant may sexually exploit his daughters or even his son's weakness and vulnerability. The tyrant king manifests in all of us at some time or another when we feel pushed to the limit, when we are exhausted, when we are getting inflated. But we can see it operating most of the time in certain personality configurations, most notably in the so-called narcissistic personality disorder. These people really feel that they are the center of the universe, although they aren't centered themselves, and that others exist to serve them. Instead of mirroring others, they insatiably seek mirroring from them. Instead of seeing others, they seek to be seen by them. The man possessed by the tyrant is very sensitive to criticism, and though putting on a threatening front, will at the slightest remark feel weak and deflated. He won't show you this, however. What you will see, unless you know what to look for, is rage. But under the rage is a sense of worthlessness, of vulnerability and weakness. For behind the tyrant lies the other pole of the king's bipolar shadow system, the weakling. If he can't be identified with the king energy... He feels he is nothing. 
The hidden presence of this passive pole explains the hunger for mirroring, for adore me, worship me, see how important I am that we feel from so many of our superiors and friends. This explains their angry outbursts and their attacks on those they see as weak, that is, those upon whom they project their own inner weakling. The man possessed by the weakling lacks centeredness, calmness, and security within himself, and this also leads him into paranoia. The man possessed by the bipolar shadow king has much to fear, in fact, because his oppressive behaviors, often including cruelty, beg for an in-kind response from others. A defensive, hostile, get-them-before-they-get-you paranoia is destructive of one's own character and that of others, and invites retaliation. We can readily see the tyrant's relationship to the high chair tyrant, rising as he does out of this infantile pattern. Grandiosity is normal, in a certain way, in the divine child. It is appropriate for the divine child, like the baby Jesus, to want and need to be adored, even by kings. What parents need to do, and this is very difficult, is give the divine child in their own child just the right amount of adoration and affirmation so that they can let their human child down off the high chair easily, gradually into the real world where gods cannot live as mortal humans. The parents need to help their human baby boy learn gradually not to identify with the divine child. If they adore him too much and don't help the baby boy's ego form outside of the archetype, then he may never get down from his high chair. Inflated with the power of the high chair tyrant, he will simply cross into adulthood thinking he is Caesar. If we challenge a person like this and say to him, My God, you think you're Caesar? He may very well say, Yeah, what about it? This is one way the Shadow King gets formed in men. The other way the Shadow King is formed is when the parents have abused the baby boy and attacked his grandiosity and gloriousness from the beginning. The grandiosity of the divine child, high chair tyrant, then gets split off and dropped into the boy's unconscious for safekeeping. The boy may, as a consequence, come under the power of the weakling prince. Later, when he is an adult and functioning primarily under the dominance of the weakling, under the enormous pressures of the adult world, his repressed grandiosity may explode to the surface, completely raw and primitive, completely unmodulated and very powerful. This is the man who seemed cool-headed and rational and nice, but who, once he's been promoted, suddenly becomes a different person, a little Hitler. This is the man for whom the saying, power corrupts, absolute power corrupts absolutely, is entirely accurate. The first task in accessing the king energy for would-be human kings is to disidentify our egos from it. We need to achieve what psychologists call cognitive distance from the king in both his integrated fullness and in his split bipolar shadow forms. Realistic greatness in adult life, as opposed to inflation and grandiosity, involves recognizing our proper relationship to this and the other mature masculine energies. The ego of the mature man needs to think of itself, no matter what status or power it has temporarily achieved, as the servant of a transpersonal will or cause. It needs to think of itself as a steward of the king energies, not for the benefit of itself, but for the benefit of those within its realm, whatever that realm might be. There are two ways. 
to look at the difference between the active and passive poles in the bipolar shadow system of the archetypes. As we have seen, one way is to view the archetypal structures as triangular. The other way is to talk about the ego's identification with or disidentification from the archetype in its fullness. In the case of identification, the result is ego inflation, accompanied by a fixation at infantile levels of development. In the case of extreme disidentification, the ego experiences itself as deprived of access to the archetype completely. It is, in actuality, caught in the passive pole of the king's dysfunctional shadow. The ego feels starved for king energy. This sense of deprivation and lack of ownership of the sources of and motives for power are always features of the passive poles of the archetypes. The shadow king as tyrant, because he arises according to this perspective, when the ego is identified with the king energy itself, has no transpersonal commitment. He is his own priority. The ego usurps the king's place and power. The other problem in accessing this energy arises when we have lost effective touch with the life-giving king altogether. In this case, we may fall into the category of the so-called dependent personality disorder, a condition in which we project the king energy within, which we do not experience as within us, onto some external person. We experience ourselves as impotent, as incapable of acting, incapable of feeling calm and stable, without the presence and the loving attention of that other person who is carrying our king energy projection for us. When we are out of touch with our own inner king and give the power of our lives to others, we may be courting catastrophe on a scale larger than the personal. Those we make our kings may lead us into lost battles, abuse in our families, the horrors of a Nazi Germany, or they may simply abandon us to our own underlying weakness. But when we are accessing the king energy correctly, as servants of our own inner king, we will manifest in our own lives the qualities of the good and rightful king, the king in his fullness. We will feel centered and calm and hear ourselves speak from an inner authority. We will have the capacity to mirror and to bless ourselves and others. We will have the capacity to care for others deeply and genuinely. We will have a sense of being a participant in creating a more just, calm, and creative world. We will have a transpersonal devotion not only to our families, our friends, our companies, our causes, our religions, but also to the world. We live in a time when people are generally uncomfortable with the warrior form of masculine energy and for some good reasons. Women especially are uncomfortable with it because they have often been the most direct victims of it in its shadow form. Around the planet, warfare in our century has reached such monstrous and pervasive proportions that aggressive energy itself is looked upon with deep suspicion and fear. All we have to do is glance over the history of our species a history which has been defined in large part by war. We see warrior traditions in nearly every civilization. In our century, the whole globe has been convulsed by two world wars. A third and final one, despite the recent East-West thaw, still hangs over our heads. Some psychologists see human aggressiveness emerging out of infantile rage the child's natural reaction to abuse on a massive scale. We believe there's much truth to this view, especially in the light of the prevalence of what we will be calling the shadow warrior. But we believe that the warrior should not be identified with human rage in any simple way, quite the opposite. We also believe that this masculine energy form persists because the warrior is a basic building block of masculine psychology. 
It is true that warrior energy often goes awry. When this happens, the results are devastating. But we still have to ask ourselves why it is so present within us. What is the warrior's function in the evolution of human life? And what is his purpose in the psyches of individual men? What are the warrior's positive qualities? And how can they help us in our personal lives and in our work? We have already mentioned aggressiveness as one of the warrior's characteristics. Aggressiveness is a stance toward life that rouses, energizes, and motivates. It pushes us to take the offensive and to move out of a defensive position about life's tasks and problems. Proper aggressiveness in the right circumstances, circumstances strategically advantageous to the goal at hand, is already half the battle. How does the warrior know what aggressiveness is appropriate under the circumstances? He knows through clarity of thinking, through discernment. The warrior is always alert. He's always awake. He knows how to focus his mind and his body. As Don Juan, the Yaqui Indian warrior sorcerer in Carlos Castaneda's Journey to Ixfan says, a warrior knows what he wants, and he knows how to get it. As a function of his clarity of mind, he is a strategist and a tactician. He can evaluate his circumstances and then adapt himself to the situation. The warrior knows when he has the force to defeat his opponent by conventional means and when he must adopt an unconventional strategy. He accurately assesses his own strength and skill. Here is a difference between the warrior and the hero. The hero, as we've said, does not know his limitations. He is romantic about his invulnerability. The warrior, however, through his clarity of thinking, realistically assesses his capacities and his limitations in any given situation. The warrior traditions all affirm that in addition to training, what enables a warrior to reach clarity of thought is living with the awareness of his own imminent death. The warrior knows the shortness of life and how fragile it is. A man under the guidance of the warrior knows how few his days are. Rather than depressing him, this awareness leads him to an outpouring of life force and to an intense experience of his life that is unknown to others. Every act counts. Each deed is done as if it were the last. This sense of the imminence of death energizes the man accessing the warrior energy to take decisive action. This means that he engages life. He never withdraws from it. He doesn't think too much. Because thinking too much can lead to doubt, and doubt to hesitation, and hesitation to inaction. Inaction can lead to losing the battle. The man who is a warrior avoids self-consciousness as we usually define it. His actions become second nature. They become unconscious reflex actions, but they are actions he has trained for through the exercise of enormous self-discipline. Part of what goes into acting decisively in any life situation, along with aggressiveness, clarity of thinking, and the awareness of one's own death, is training. The warrior energy is concerned with skill, power and accuracy, and with control both inner and outer, psychological and physical. Unlike the hero's actions, the warrior's actions are never overdone, never dramatic for the sake of drama. The warrior never acts to reassure himself that he is as potent as he hopes he is. His control is first of all over his mind and his attitudes. If these are right, the body will follow. The warrior has an unconquerable spirit. He has great courage. He is fearless. He takes responsibility for his actions, and he has self-discipline. Discipline means that he has the rigor to develop control and mastery over his mind and over his body, that he has the capacity to withstand pain, both psychological and physical. He is willing to suffer to achieve what he wants to achieve. The warrior energy also shows what we can call a transpersonal commitment. His loyalty is to something, a cause, a god, a people, a task, a nation larger than individuals. 
though that transpersonal loyalty may be focused through some important person like a king. In the Arthurian stories, Lancelot, though fiercely devoted to Arthur and to Guinevere, is ultimately committed to the ideal of chivalry and to the God who lies behind such things as noble quests and the lifting up of the oppressed. Of course, because of his love for Guinevere, Lancelot unwittingly acts to destroy the object of his transpersonal commitment, Camelot. But he does so because he has encountered the paradoxically personal and transpersonal goal of romantic love. This transpersonal commitment reveals a number of other characteristics of the warrior energy. First, it makes all personal relationships relative. That is, it makes them less central than the transpersonal commitment. Thus, the psyche of a man who is adequately accessing the warrior is organized around his central commitment. This commitment eliminates a great deal of human pettiness. Living in the light of lofty ideals and spiritual realities such as God, democracy, freedom, or any other worthy transpersonal commitment so alters the focus of a man's life that petty squabbling and personal ego concerns no longer matter much. There is a story about a samurai attached to the household of a great lord. His lord had been murdered by a man from a rival house, and the samurai was sworn to avenge his lord's death. After tracking the assassin for some time, after great personal sacrifice and hardship, and after braving many dangers, the samurai found the murderer. He drew his sword to kill the man. But in that instant, the assassin spit in his face. The samurai stepped back, sheathed his sword, and turned and walked away. Why? He walked away because he was angry that he had been spat on. He would have killed the assassin in that moment out of his own personal anger, not out of his commitment to the ideal his lord represented. His execution of the man would have been out of his ego and his own feelings, not out of the warrior within. So in order to be true to his warrior calling, he had to walk away and let the murderer live. The warrior's loyalty then and his sense of duty are to something beyond and other than himself and his own concerns. The hero's loyalty, as we have seen, is really to himself, to impressing himself with himself and to impressing others. In this connection, too, the man accessing the warrior is ascetic. He lives a life exactly the opposite of most human lives. He lives not to gratify his personal needs and wishes or his physical appetites, but to bear the unbearable in the service of the transpersonal goal. We know the legends of the founders of the great faiths, Christianity and Buddhism. Jesus had to resist the temptations Satan pictured to him in the wilderness, and the Buddha had to endure his three temptations under the bow tree. These men were spiritual warriors. The man who is a warrior is devoted to his cause even unto death. This devotion to the transpersonal ideal or goal, even to the point of personal annihilation, leads a man to another of the warrior's characteristics. He is emotionally distant as long as he is in the warrior. This does not mean that the man accessing the warrior in his fullness is cruel just that he does not make his decisions and implement them out of emotional relatedness to anyone or anything except his ideal. He is, as Don Juan says, unavailable or inaccessible. As he says, to be inaccessible means that you touch the world around you sparingly with emotional detachment. This attitude is part of the clarity of the warrior's thinking, too. He looks at his task, his decisions, and his actions dispassionately and unemotionally. The warrior is often a destroyer, but the positive warrior energy destroys only what needs to be destroyed in order for something new and fresh, more alive and more virtuous to appear. Many things in our world need destroying. Corruption, tyranny, oppression, injustice, obsolete and despotic systems of government, corporate hierarchies that get in the way of the company's performance, unfulfilling lifestyles and job situations. 
And in the very act of destroying, often the warrior energy is building new civilizations, new commercial, artistic, and spiritual ventures for humankind, new relationships. When the warrior energy is connected with the other mature masculine energies, something truly splendid emerges. When the warrior is connected with the king, he is consciously stewarding the realm, and his decisive actions, clarity of thinking, discipline, and courage are in fact creative and generative. The warrior's interface with the magician archetype is what enables him to achieve such mastery and control over himself. It is what allows him to channel and direct power to accomplish his goals. His relation to the lover energy gives the warrior compassion and a sense of connectedness with all things. The lover is the masculine energy that brings him back into relatedness with human beings in all their frailty and vulnerability. The lover makes the man under the influence of the warrior compassionate at the same time that he's doing his duty. When, however, the warrior is operating on his own, unrelated to these other archetypes, the results for the mortal man accessing even the positive warrior, the warrior in his fullness, can be disastrous. As we have said, the warrior in his pure form is emotionally detached. His transpersonal loyalty radically relativizes the importance of his human relationships. This is apparent in the warrior's attitude toward sex. Women for the warrior are not for relating to, for being intimate with. They are for fun. This attitude explains the prevalence of prostitutes around military camps. It also explains the horrific tradition of the raping of conquered women. Even if he has a family, the human warrior's devotion to other duties often leads to marital problems. This same thing occurs outside of the military in the relationships and families of men whose professions call for a great deal of transpersonal devotion and long hours of discipline work and self-sacrifice. Ministers, doctors, lawyers, politicians, and many others often have emotionally devastating personal lives. Their wives and girlfriends often feel alienated and rejected, competing hopelessly with a man's true love, his work. In addition, these men, true to their warrior sexual attitudes, often have affairs with their nurses, staffers, receptionists, secretaries, and other women who admire from a safe, and sometimes not so safe, distance their masculine warrior proficiency and dedication. The warrior energy's detachment from human relationships leads to real problems, as we're suggesting. These problems become enormously hurtful and destructive to a man when he's caught in the warrior's bipolar shadow. In the movie The Great Santini, Robert Duvall plays a marine fighter pilot who runs his family like a miniature Marine Corps. Most of his remarks and behavior toward his wife and children are deprecating, critical, commanding, and designed to put distance between him and the family members who keep trying to relate to him lovingly. The destructiveness of this way of relating eventually becomes so obvious to everyone, especially to the older son, that there can no longer be any hiding from the fact that Santini's sometimes violent behavior results from his own inability to be tender and genuinely intimate. The great Santini, under the power of the sadist, constantly has his emotional sword out, swinging at everyone. His daughters, who need to be treated like girls, not marines, his oldest son, who needs his guidance and nurturing, and even his wife. Though detachment in itself is not necessarily bad, as we've said, it does leave the door open to the demon of cruelty. Because he is so vulnerable in this area of relatedness, the man under the influence of the warrior needs urgently to have his mind and his feelings under control, not repressed, but under control. Otherwise, cruelty will sneak in the back door when he's not looking. The warrior as avenging spirit comes into us when we are very frightened and very angry. A kind of bloodlust, as it is called, comes over men in the stressful situation of actual combat, as well as in other stressful life situations. Along with this passion for destruction and cruelty goes a hatred of the weak, of the helpless and vulnerable. We see this kind of sadism displayed in boot camp in the name of supposedly necessary ritual humiliation designed to deprive recruits of their individuality and put them under the power of a transpersonal devotion. 
Far too often the drill sergeant's motives are the motives of the sadistic warrior seeking to humiliate and violate the men put in his charge. It may seem at first unlikely, but the sadistic warrior's cruelty is directly related to what is wrong with the hero energy. There are similarities between the shadow warrior and the hero. The shadow warrior carries into adulthood the adolescent insecurity, violent emotionalism, and the desperation of the hero as he seeks to make a stand against the overwhelming power of the feminine, which always tends to evoke the masochistic or cowardly pole of the hero's dysfunctional shadow. We don't have to look far to see this destructive warrior operating in our own lives. Sadly, we must acknowledge it in the workplace whenever a boss puts down, harasses, unjustly fires, or in many other ways mistreats his subordinates. We must also acknowledge the sadist in our homes in the appalling statistics of wife-beating and child abuse. Although we may all become vulnerable to the sadistic warrior at some time or another, there is a particular personality type that has this energy in spades. This is the compulsive personality disorder. Compulsive personalities are workaholics, constantly with their noses to the grindstone. They have a tremendous capacity to endure pain, and they often manage to get an enormous amount of work done. But what is driving their non-stop engines is deep anxiety, the hero's desperation. They have a very slim grasp on their own worthwhileness. They don't know what it is they really want, what they are missing and would like to have. They spend their lives attacking everything and everyone, their jobs, the life tasks before them, themselves, and others. In the process, they are eaten alive by the sadistic warrior and soon reach burnout. We all know these people. They are the managers who stay at the office long after everyone else has gone home. And when they do finally go home, they seldom have a good night's sleep. These are the ministers, social workers, therapists, the doctors and lawyers who work literally day and night trying to plug the physical and psychological holes in other people, sacrificing their own lives for the sake of saving others. In the process, they really do a lot of harm, both to themselves and to those others who can't measure up to their impossible standards. They can't, of course, measure up to their own standards, so they mercilessly abuse themselves. If you have to admit to yourself that you really don't take care of yourself, that you don't care for your mental and physical well-being, then very probably the shadow warrior has got you. As we've already suggested, men in some professions are especially endangered by dysfunctional warrior energy. The military is an obvious example. What may not be so obvious is that revolutionaries and activists of all kinds may also fall into the sadistic pole of the shadow warrior. The old saying that we become what we hate applies here. It is a sad truth that leaders of revolutions, political, social, economic, the little revolutions within the corporation or the voluntary organization, once they have ousted the tyrants and oppressors, often by violence and terrorism, become themselves the new tyrants and the new oppressors. Salespeople and teachers, along with members of the many other professions already cited, can easily fall prey to compulsive, self-driven, workaholic patterns. Any profession that puts a great deal of pressure on a person to perform at his best all the time leaves us vulnerable to the shadow system of the warrior. If we are not secure enough in our own inner structure, we will rely on our performance in the outer world to bolster our self-confidence. And because the need for this bolstering is so great, our behavior will gravitate toward the compulsive. The man who becomes obsessed with succeeding has already failed. He is desperately trying to repress the masochist within him, yet he is already displaying masochistic and self-punishing behaviors. The masochist is the passive pole of the warrior's shadow, that pushover and whipped puppy that lies just beneath the sadist's rageful displays. Men are right to fear the coward within them, even if they don't have the sense to fear their macho exteriors.
The masochus projects the warrior energy onto others and causes a man to experience himself as powerless. The man possessed by the masochist is unable to defend himself psychologically. He allows others and himself to push him around, to exceed the limits of what he can tolerate and still keep his self-respect, not to mention his psychological and physical health. All of us, no matter what our walk of life, can fall under the power of the warrior's bipolar shadow in any area of our lives. It may be that we don't know when to quit an impossible relationship, a circle of friends, or a frustrating job. We all know the saying, quit while you're ahead, or learn to cut your losses. The compulsive personality, no matter what the danger signs, digs in and works harder. If we are under the power of the masochist, we will take far too much abuse for far too long and then explode in a sadistic outburst of verbal and even physical violence. This kind of oscillation between the active and passive poles of archetypal shadows is characteristic of those dysfunctional systems. If we are possessed by the active pole of the warrior shadow, we will experience him in his sadistic form. We will abuse ourselves and others. If we feel that we are not in touch with the warrior, however, we will be possessed by his passive pole. We will be cowardly masochist. We will dream but not be able to act decisively to make our dreams come true. We will lack vigor and be depressed. We will lack the capacity to endure the pain necessary for the accomplishment of any worthwhile goal. As we do with all of the archetypes described on these tapes, we all need to ask ourselves not if we are possessed by one or both poles of their shadow systems, but in what ways we are failing to access properly the masculine energy potentials available to us. If we are accessing the warrior appropriately, we will be energetic, decisive, courageous, enduring, persevering, and loyal to some greater good beyond our own personal gain. At the same time, we need to be leavening the warrior with the energies of the other mature masculine forms, the king, the magician, and the lover. If we are accessing the warrior in the right way, we will, at the same time that we are detached, be warm, compassionate, appreciative, and generative. We will care for ourselves and others. We will fight good fights in order to make the world a better and more fulfilling place for everyone. There's a wonderful scene in the movie The Right Stuff in which Gordo Cooper reaches a tracking station in Australia's Outback from which he's going to monitor John Glenn's first orbital flight. As he pulls up to the station and steps out of his Land Rover, he meets a band of Aborigines camping there. A young man steps forward. Gordo asks him, Who are you guys? The Aborigine replies, We're Aborigines. Who are you? Gordo says, I'm an astronaut. I fly up there among the moon and the stars. The young aborigine replies, Oh, you too? See that bloke over there? And he points to a wizened old man sitting under the shadow of an umbrella, his eyes squinting into the distance as if he's staring into a reality others do not see. The young aborigine explains, He knows too. He flies, too. He knows. Later that night, while Glenn is orbiting overhead, sparks flying from his deteriorating heat shield, the Aborigines build a huge bonfire, swing their bull roarers, and waft the sparks from the fire skyward to join, so the movie editing shows it, the sparks from Glenn's capsule. By sympathetic magic, the channeling of hidden energies. The Aborigine magician helps give Glenn strength and aids him on his way. We often mistakenly think that we are very different from our ancient ancestors with our great knowledge and our amazing technology. But the origins of our knowledge and our technology lie in the minds of men like that old Aborigine. He and all those like him in tribal and ancient societies were accessing the magician energy. And it is the magician energy that drives our own modern civilization. 
Shamans, medicine men, wizards, witch doctors, brujos, inventors, scientists, doctors, lawyers, technicians, all these are accessing the same masculine energy pattern, no matter what age or culture they live in. The energies of the magician archetype, wherever and whenever we encounter them, are twofold. The magician is the knower, and he is the master of technology. Furthermore, the man who is guided by the power of the magician is able to fulfill these magician functions in part by his use of ritual initiatory process. He is the ritual elder who guides the process of transformation both within and without. The human magician is always an initiate himself, and one of his tasks is to initiate others. But of what is he an initiate? The magician is an initiate of secret and hidden knowledge of all kinds. And this is the important point. All knowledge that takes special training to acquire is the province of the magician energy. The magician is a universal archetype that has operated in the masculine psyche throughout history. It can be accessed today by modern men in their work and in their personal lives. It is thought by some anthropologists that in the very ancient past, the masculine energies of the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover were once inseparable, and that one man, the chief, manifested all the functions of these archetypes in an holistic way. Since all four of these energies are in the masculine self and balanced there, it may be that the chief was the only one in the tribe who experienced himself as a whole man. Be that as it may, in the aboriginal societies that still exist today, these masculine energies are already somewhat distinct. There is the king or chief, and there are the chief's warriors, and there is the magician, the holy man, the witch doctor, the shaman. Whatever his title... His specialty is knowing something that others don't know. He knows, for instance, the secrets of the movements of the stars, the phases of the moon, the north-south swings of the sun. He knows when to plant and when to harvest or when the herds will arrive next spring. He can predict the weather. He has knowledge of medicinal herbs and of poisons. He understands the hidden dynamics of the human psyche and so can manipulate other human beings for good or ill. He is the one who can effectively bless and curse. He understands the links between the unseen world of the spirits, the divine world, and the world of human beings and of nature. It is to him that people go with their questions, their problems, pains, and diseases of the body and of the mind. He is confessor and priest. He is the one who can think through the issues that are not obvious to other people. He is a seer and a prophet in the sense not only of predicting the future, but also of seeing deeply. This secret knowledge, of course, gives the magician an enormous amount of power. And because he has knowledge of the dynamics of energy flows and patterns in nature, in human individuals and in societies, and among the gods, the deep unconscious forces, he is a master at containing and channeling power. Ours is, we believe, the age of the magician, because it is a technological age. It is an age of the magician, at least in his materialistic concern with understanding and having power over nature. But in terms of non-materialistic, psychological or spiritual initiatory process, the magician energy seems to be in short supply. We have already noted the absence of ritual elders who can initiate men into the deeper and more mature levels of masculine identity. Ours is an age, as we've said, of personal and gender identity chaos. And chaos is always the result of inadequate accessing of the magician in some vital area of life. Two sciences, 
subatomic physics and depth psychology still do the work of the ancient magicians in a holistic way that brings together the material and the psychological sides of the magician energy. Each seeks to know and then to at least partially control the very wellsprings of the same hidden energies the ancients probed so profoundly. Modern subatomic physics, it has been said, looks very much like Eastern mysticism as it approaches the intuited insights of Hinduism and Taoism. This new physics is discovering a micro-world beneath our seemingly solid macro-world of sense perceptions. In this hidden world beneath the surface of things, reality becomes very strange indeed. Particles and waves, so radically different in their properties in the macro world, in the micro world are the same thing. A particle can appear to be in two separate places at the same time without ever having divided. Matter loses its solidity and seems to be like gathered nodes of energy concentrated in localized spots for more or less brief periods of time. And energy itself seems to arise out of an even more deeply concealed grid-like patterning of the void of space, which can no longer be viewed as nothing. Particles arise from this underlying energy field like waves on the ocean, only to subside or decay again into the nothingness from which they came. Questions arise about time. What is it? What direction is it going? Does it ever reverse? Do certain kinds of subatomic particles travel backward in time and then reverse their direction to move in our time again? What is the origin of the universe and its final fate? In the light of these new discoveries and questions, old questions resurface. What is the nature of being and of non-being? Are there, in fact, the other dimensions that mathematics predicts? In what ways might they be equivalent to what the ancient religions called other planes or worlds? Physicists have entered the realm of truly hidden and secret knowledge, and they are moving in a world of thought that looks very much like the world of the ancient magician. The same is true of depth psychology. Jung as he was making his first maps of the unconscious, was struck by the similarities between what he was discovering about the energy flows and the archetypal patterns in the human psyche and quantum physics. Jung realized that he had stumbled onto a vast world that modern people had largely neglected, a world of living images and symbols that rose and fell like the waves of energy that seemed to account for our material universe. These archetypal realities hidden in the deep void of the collective unconscious seem to be the building blocks of our thoughts and feelings and of our habitual patterns of behaviors and reactions, our macro world of personality. For Jung, this collective unconscious looked very much like the unseen energy fields of the subatomic physicists, and to Jung, both of these looked a lot like the mysterious underlying pleroma discovered by the Gnostics. The conclusion of both modern physics and depth psychology is that things are not what they seem. What we experience as normal reality about ourselves and nature is only the tip of an iceberg that rises out of an unfathomable abyss. Knowledge of this hidden realm is the province of the magician, and it is through the magician energy that we will come to understand our lives with a degree of profundity not dreamed of for at least a thousand years of Western history. What does all this mean for us men pursuing our quests for personal happiness and the life enhancement of our loved ones, our companies, our causes, our peoples, our nations, and the world? What functions does the magician energy of the mature masculine perform in our daily lives? The magician energy is the archetype of awareness and of insight, primarily, but also of knowledge of anything that is not immediately apparent or commonsensical. 
It is the archetype that governs what is called in psychology the observing ego. While it is sometimes assumed in depth psychology that the ego is secondary in importance to the unconscious, the ego is in fact vital to our survival. It is only when it is possessed by, identified with, and inflated by another energy form, an archetype or a complex, which is an archetypal fragment, like the tyrant, for instance, that it malfunctions. Its proper role is to stand back and to observe, to monitor the data coming in from both the outside and the inside, and then, out of its wisdom, to make the necessary life decisions. When the observing ego is aligned with the masculine self along an ego-self axis, it is initiated into the secret wisdom of this self. It is, in one sense, a servant of the masculine self, but in another sense, it is the leader and the channeler of this self's power. It is, then, a vital player in the personality as a whole. The observing ego is detached from the ordinary flow of daily events, feelings, and experiences. The magician archetype, in concert with this observing ego, keeps us insulated from the overwhelming power of the other archetypes. It is the mathematician and the engineer in each of us that regulates the life functions of the psyche as a whole. The magician energy is present in the warrior archetype in the form of his clarity of thinking. Whenever we are faced with what seems like an impossible decision in our daily lives, whenever we make decisions with careful and insightful deliberation, we are accessing the magician. The magician often comes online in a crisis. Often, in difficult situations, people are drawn into some kind of space and time frame that can be called sacred because it is so different from the space and time we normally experience. This sacred space is something men who are guided by the magician know well. These men may actually put themselves into that space deliberately, much like ritual magicians who draw their magic circles and recite their incantations. They enter this space by listening to certain musical pieces, by tending to a hobby, by taking long walks in the woods, by meditating on certain themes and mental pictures, and by many other methods. When they enter this sacred space within, they can be in touch with the magician. They can emerge from the inner space seeing what they need to do about a problem and knowing how to do it. We believe that the many ways in which the magician has appeared in history and in which he appears among men today are mere fragments of a once whole image. That primordial magician in men has manifested itself most fully in what anthropologists refer to as the shaman. The shaman in traditional societies was the healer, the one who restored life, who found lost souls, and who discovered the hidden causes of misfortune. He was the one who restored wholeness and fullness of being to both individuals and communities. Indeed, the magician energy today still has the same ultimate aim. The magician and the shaman as his fullest human vessel aims at fullness of being for all things. As positive as the magician archetype is, like all the other forms of the mature masculine energy potentials, it too has a shadow side. If ours is an age of the magician, then it is also an age of the bipolar shadow magician. We need only to think about the mushrooming problem of toxic waste poisoning and blighting our planet's environment. It was the shadow magician that handed us, in the darkest days of World War II, not only the technology of the death camps, but also the doomsday weapon that still hangs over our heads. Mastery over nature is running amok, and with incalculable results that we are already beginning to feel. 
The active pole of the shadow magician is, in a special sense, a power shadow. A man under this shadow doesn't guide others as a magician does. He directs them in ways they cannot see. His interest is not in initiating others by graduated degrees, degrees that they can integrate and handle into better, happier, and more fulfilled lives. Rather, the manipulator maneuvers people by withholding from them information they may need for their own well-being. The shadow magician is not only detached, then he is also cruel. The man under the power of the manipulator not only hurts others with his cynical detachment from the world of human values and his subliminal technologies of manipulation, he also hurts himself. This is the man who thinks too much, who stands back from his life and never lives it. Whenever we are detached, unrelated, and withholding, when what we know could help others, whenever we use our knowledge as a weapon to belittle and control others or to bolster our status or wealth at others' expense, we are identified with the shadow magician as manipulator. We are doing black magic, damaging ourselves as well as those who could benefit from our wisdom. The passive pole of the magician's shadow is what we are calling the naive or innocent one. The innocent one is a carryover from childhood into adulthood of the passive pole of the precocious child's shadow, the dummy. The innocent one wants the power and status that traditionally come to the man who is a magician, at least in the societally sanctioned fields but he doesn't want to take the responsibilities that belong to a true magician. He does not want to share and to teach. He does not want to be a steward of sacred space. He doesn't want to know himself, and he certainly doesn't want to make the great effort necessary to become skilled at containing and channeling power in constructive ways. He wants to learn just enough to derail those who are making worthwhile efforts. While he is protesting the innocence of his hidden power motives, the man possessed by the innocent one, too good to make any real efforts himself, blocks others and seeks their downfall. Whereas the trickster plays his tricks in part for the sake of revealing the truth, the innocent one hides the truth for the sake of achieving and maintaining his own precarious status. While the trickster aims at the necessary deflation of our grandiosity, the shadow magician, as both manipulator and innocent one, works at deflating us when such deflation is not only unnecessary, but harmful as well. The innocent one's underlying motivations come from envy of those who act, who live, who want to share. His detachment and his impressive behavior, his deflating remarks, his hostility toward questions, even his accumulated expertise are all designed to cover his real inner desolation and hide his actual lifelessness and irresponsibility from the world. The man possessed by the innocent one commits both sins of commission and sins of omission, but hides his hostile motives behind an impenetrable wall of feigned naivete. Such men are slippery and elusive. If we challenge their innocence, they will often react with a show of bewilderment. We may even feel ashamed of ourselves for having attributed base motives to them and conclude that we must be paranoid. But we will not be able to escape the uneasy feeling that we have been manipulated. And in that feeling, we will have detected the active pole of the magician's shadow behind the smokescreen of innocence. If we are possessed by the manipulator, we will be in the grip of the magician's power shadow. If we feel that we are out of touch with the magician in his fullness, 
we will be caught in the dishonest and denying passive pole of his shadow. In this case, we will not have much sense of our own inner structure, of our own calmness and clear-headedness. We won't have a sense of inner security, and we won't feel that we can trust our thinking processes. We won't be able to detach from our emotions and our problems. We're likely to experience inner chaos and to be vulnerable to outside pressures that will push and pull us in many different directions. We will act in a passive-aggressive way toward others, but claim to be innocent of any ill intentions. If we are accessing the magician appropriately, we will be adding to our professional and personal lives a dimension of clear-sightedness, of deep understanding and reflection about ourselves and others, and technical skill in our outer work and in our inner handling of psychological forces. As we access the magician, we need to regulate this energy with the other three archetypes of mature masculinity patterns. None of them, as we've suggested, works well alone. We need to mix with the magician the king's concern for generativity and generosity, the warrior's ability to act decisively and with courage, and the lover's deep and convinced connectedness to all things. We will then be using our knowledge, our containment, and our channeling of energy flows for human benefit and perhaps for the enhancement of the whole planet. There are many forms of love. The ancient Greeks spoke of agape, non-erotic love, what the Bible calls brotherly love. They spoke of eros, both in the narrow sense of phallic or sexual love, and the wider sense of love as the bonding and uniting urge of all things. The Romans spoke of amor, the complete union of one body and soul with another body and soul. These forms and all other forms of love, for the most part varieties of these, are the living expression of the lover energy in human life. Jungians often use the name of the Greek god Eros to talk about the lover energy. They also use the Latin term libido. By these terms they mean not just sexual appetites, but a general appetite for life. We believe that the lover, by whatever name, is the primal energy pattern of what we could call vividness, aliveness, and passion. It lives through the great primal hungers of our species for sex, food, well-being, reproduction, creative adaptation to life's hardships, and ultimately a sense of meaning without which human beings cannot go on with their lives. The lover's drive is to satisfy those hungers. The lover archetype is primary to the psyche also because it is the energy of sensitivity to the outer environment. It expresses what Jungians call the sensation function, the function of the psyche that is trained in on all of the details of sensory experience, the function that notices color and forms, sounds, tactile sensations, and smells. The lover also monitors the changing textures of the inner psychological world as it responds to incoming sensory impressions. We can easily see the survival value of this energy potential for our distant ancestors who struggled for survival in a dangerous world. How does the lover show up in men today? How does he help us to survive and even to flourish? What are the lover's characteristics? The lover is the archetype of play and display, of healthy embodiment, of being in the world of sensuous pleasure and in one's own body without shame. Thus, the lover is deeply sensual, sensually aware and sensitive to the physical world in all its splendor. For the man accessing the lover, all things are bound to each other in mysterious ways. He sees the world in a grain of sand. This is the consciousness that knew long before the invention of holography that we live in a holographic universe in which every part reflects every other in immediate and sympathetic union. 
It isn't just that the lover energy sees the world in a grain of sand. He feels that this is so. We believe that the man accessing the lover is open to a collective unconscious, perhaps even vaster than that which Jung proposed. Jung's collective unconscious is the unconscious of human beings as an entire species and contains, as Jung said, the unconscious memories of all that has ever happened in the lives of all the people that have ever lived. But if, as Jung suggested, the collective unconscious appears to be limitless, why stop here? What if the collective unconscious is vast enough to include the impressions and sensations of all living things? Perhaps, indeed, it includes what some scientists are now calling primary awareness, even in plants. Eastern philosophers have said that we are like waves on the surface of this vast sea. The lover energy has immediate and intimate contact with this underlying oceanic connectedness. Along with sensitivity to all inner and outer things comes passion. The lover's connectedness is not primarily intellectual. It is through feeling. The primal hungers are felt passionately in all of us, at least beneath the surface. But the lover knows this with a deep knowing. Being close to the unconscious means being close to the fire, to the fires of life, and on the biological level to the fires of the life-engendering metabolic processes. The man under the influence of the lover wants to touch and be touched. He wants to touch everything physically and emotionally, and he wants to be touched by everything. He recognizes no boundaries. He wants to live out the connectedness he feels with the world inside, in the context of his powerful feelings, and outside in the context of his relationships with other people. Ultimately, he wants to experience the world of sensual experience in its totality. The lover energy, arising as it does out of the Oedipal child, is also the source of spirituality, especially of what we call mysticism. In the mystical tradition, which underlies and is present in all the world's religions, the lover energy, through the mystics, intuits the ultimate oneness of all that is, and actively seeks to experience that oneness in daily life, while it still dwells in a mortal, finite man. The man under the influence of the lover does not want to stop at socially created boundaries. He stands against the artificiality of such things. His life is often unconventional. Consequently, because he is opposed to law in this broad sense, we see enacted in his life of confrontation with the conventional the old tension between sensuality and morality, between love and duty, between, as Joseph Campbell poetically describes it, amor and Roma, amor standing for passionate experience and Roma standing for duty and responsibility to law and order. The lover energy is thus utterly opposed, at least at first glance, to the other energies of the mature masculine. His interests are the opposite of the warrior's, the magicians and the kings concern for boundaries, containment, order, and discipline. What is true within each man's psyche is true in the panorama of history and cultures as well. In the history of our religions and the cultures that flow from them, we can see this pattern of tension between the lover and other archetypes of the mature masculine. Christianity, Judaism, and Islam what are called moral or ethical religions, have all persecuted the lover. Christianity has taught more or less consistently that the world, the very object of the lover's devotion, is evil, that the Lord of this world is Satan, and that it is he who is the source of the sensuous pleasures, the foremost of which is sex, that Christians must avoid. The church has often stood opposed to artists, innovators, and creators. Following the ancient Hebrew practice, the church also persecuted psychics and mediums, people who, along with artists and others, live very close to the image-making unconscious and hence to the lover. Here is a source of the witch burnings of the Middle Ages. 
Some of the witches, as far as the church was concerned, were not only psychic, that is, deeply intuitive and sensitive to impressions from the inner world of nuanced feelings, but they were also nature worshipers. Because the church labeled the world of nature evil, the witches were believed to be worshipers of Satan, the lover. Archetypes cannot be banished or wished away. The lover crept back into Christianity in the form of Christian mysticism. The doctrine of the Incarnation itself proclaims God's permanent and intimate intercourse with all human beings. It is the presence of the lover in Christian mystical experience and theological thought that underlies the Church's ambivalent but nonetheless sacramental view of the material universe. What ways of life manifest the lover most clearly? There are two primary ones, the artist and the psychic. The artist is sensitive and sensual. Artists live very close to the fiery power of the creative unconscious. In a similar way, genuine psychics also live in a world of sensations and vibrations, of deeply felt intuitions. Their conscious awareness, like that of the artist, is extraordinarily open to invasion from other people's thoughts and feelings and from the murky realm of the collective unconscious. They seem to move in a world behind or beneath the world of daylight common sense. From this hidden world they receive, often in the form of almost audible words, gusts of strong feelings, unaccounted for smells, sensations of heat and cold not accessible to others, images of great horror and beauty, and clues about what is really going on with other people. The businessman who has hunches is also accessing the lover. So are we all when we have premonitions and intuitions about people, situations, or our own future. In those moments, the underlying unity of things is revealed to us, even in mundane ways, and we are drawn into the lover energy which connects us with realities of which we are not normally aware. Any artistic or creative endeavor and almost every profession is drawing upon the energies of the lover for creativity. All of us, when we stop doing and just let ourselves be and feel without the pressure to perform, are feeling the lover. Of course, we feel him strongly in our love lives. In our culture, this is the main avenue most of us have for getting in touch with the lover. Many men literally live for the thrill of falling in love, that is, falling into the power of the lover. In this ecstatic consciousness, which comes to even the most hard-boiled of us, we delight in our beloved and cherish her in all her beauty of body and soul. Through our emotional and physical union with her, we are transported into a divine world of ecstasy and pleasure on the one hand and pain and sorrow on the other. The whole world looks and feels different to us, more alive, more vivid, more meaningful. This is the work of the lover. A man living in either pole of the lover's shadow, like a man living in any of the shadow forms of the masculine energies, is possessed by the very energy that could be a source of life and well-being for him if accessed appropriately. As long as he is possessed by the shadow lover, however, the energy works to his destruction and to the destruction of others around him. The most forceful and urgent question a man identified with the addicted lover asks is, why should I put any limits on my sensual and sexual experience of this vast world, a world that holds unending pleasures for me? There are the so-called addictive personalities, people who can't stop eating or drinking or smoking or using drugs. The addict lives for the pleasure of the moment only and locks us into a web of immobility from which we cannot escape. This is what the theologian Reinhold Niebuhr talked about as the sin of sensuality. Here's where we see the Don Juan syndrome. Monogamy can be seen as the product of a man's own deep rootedness and centeredness. He is bounded not by external rules, but by his own inner structures, his own sense of his masculine well-being and calm, and his own inner joy. 
But the man moving from one woman to another, compulsively searching for he knows not what, is a man whose inner structures have not yet solidified. Because he himself is fragmented within and not centered, he is pushed and pulled around by the illusory wholeness he thinks is out there in the world of feminine forms and sensual experiences. For the addict, the world presents itself as tantalizing fragments of a lost whole. Caught in the foreground, he can't see the underlying background. Caught in the myriads of forms, as the Hindus say, he can't find the oneness that would bring him calm and stability. Living on the finite side of the prism, he can only experience light in its dazzling but fractured rainbow hues. This is another way of talking about what ancient religions called idolatry. The addicted lover unconsciously invests the finite fragments of his experience with the power of the unity, which he can never experience. The restlessness of the man under the power of the addict is an expression of his search for a way out of the spider's web. The man who is possessed by the web of maya is twisting and turning, frantically struggling to find a way out of the world. But instead of taking the only way out there is, he struggles and deepens his predicament. This happens because what he thinks is the way out is really the way deeper in. Psychologists talk about the problems that stem from a man's possession by the addict as boundary issues. For the man possessed by the addict, there are no boundaries. As we've said, the lover does not want to be limited, and when we are possessed by him, we cannot stand to be limited. A man possessed by the addicted lover is really a man possessed by the unconscious, his own personal unconscious and the collective unconscious. He is overwhelmed by it as if by the sea. This oceanic chaos, the unconscious, is, as we have seen, imaged in many mythologies as feminine. It is mother. We can see then how the shadow lover as addict is a carryover from childhood into adulthood of the absorption into the mother of the mama's boy. The man under the power of the addict is still within the mother, and he's struggling to get out. He must learn that his lack of masculine structure, his lack of discipline, his resulting affairs, and his authority problems will inevitably get him into trouble. What happens if we feel that we are out of touch with the lover in his fullness? We are then possessed by the impotent lover. We will experience our lives in an unfeeling way. We will describe symptoms that psychologists call flattened affect, lack of enthusiasm, lack of vividness, lack of aliveness. We will feel bored and listless. We may have trouble getting up in the morning and trouble going to sleep at night. We may find ourselves speaking in a monotone, we may find ourselves increasingly alienated from our family, our co-workers, and our friends. We may feel hungry but lack an appetite. Everything may begin to feel like the passage in the biblical book of Ecclesiastes that declares, All is vanity and a striving after wind. And there is nothing new under the sun. In short, we will become depressed. People who are habitually possessed by the impotent lover are chronically depressed. They feel a lack of connection with others, and they feel cut off from themselves. We see this in therapy often. The therapist will be able to tell from the expression on the client's face or from his body language that some feeling is trying to express itself. But if we ask the client what he is feeling, he will have absolutely no idea. He may say something like, I don't know, I just feel there's this kind of fog. Everything is just hazy. This often happens when the client is getting too close to really hot material. What happens then is that a shield goes up between the conscious ego and the feeling. That shield is depression. But we all know that when we're depressed that we just don't have the motivation to do the things we either want to do or have to do. This frequently happens to the elderly. 
Their physical problems, isolation, and lack of useful work plunge them into depression. The zest for life is gone. The lover seems nowhere to be found. Pretty soon these older men stop fixing meals for themselves. They feel that there's nothing to live for. The Bible says that without a vision the people perish. It is specifically without the imaging and visioning of the lover that people perish. But it isn't just the lack of a vision that signifies the oppressive power of the impotent lover in a man's life. This man's sex life has gone stale. He is sexually inactive. Such sexual inactivity may stem from any number of factors. Boredom and lack of ecstasy with his mate, smoldering anger about his relationship, tension and stress on the job, money worries, or the sense of being emasculated by the feminine or by the other men in his life. In conjunction with the impotent lover, this man has either regressed into a presexual boy or he is mainlining either the warrior or the magician or a combination of the three. His sexual and sensual sensitivity has been overwhelmed by other concerns. As his sexual partner becomes more demanding, he withdraws even further into the passive pole of the lover's shadow. At this point, the opposite pole of the archetypal shadow may rescue him by propelling him into the addict's quest for the perfect satisfaction of his sexuality beyond the mundane world of his primary relationship. If we are appropriately accessing the lover, but keeping our ego structure strong, we feel related, connected, alive, enthusiastic, compassionate, empathic, energized, and romantic about our lives, our goals, our work, and our achievements. It is the lover, properly accessed, that gives us a sense of meaning, what we've been calling spirituality. It is the lover who is the source of our longings for a better world for ourselves and others. He it is who is the idealist and the dreamer. He is the one who wants us to have an abundance of good things. I have come to bring you life that you might have it more abundantly, says the lover. The lover keeps the other masculine energies humane, loving, and related to each other and to the real-life situation of human beings struggling in a difficult world. The king, the warrior, and the magician, as we've suggested, harmonize pretty well with each other. They do so because without the lover, they are all essentially detached from life. They need the lover to energize them, to humanize them, and to give them their ultimate purpose, love. They need the lover to keep them from becoming sadistic. The lover needs them as well. The lover without boundaries, in his chaos of feelings and sensuality, needs the king to define limits for him, to give him structure, to order his chaos so that it can be channeled creatively. Without limits, the lover energy turns negative and destructive. The lover needs the warrior in order to be able to act decisively, in order to detach with the clean cut of the sword from the web of immobilizing sensuality. And the lover needs the magician to help him back off from the ensnaring effect of his emotions in order to reflect, to get a more objective perspective on things, to disconnect enough at least to see the big picture and to experience the reality beneath the seeming. Tragically, the unrelenting attacks on our vitality and on our shining begin early in our lives. Many of us may have so repressed the lover in us that it has become very hard for us to feel passionate about anything in our lives. The trouble with most of us is not that we feel too much passion, but that we don't feel our passion much at all. We don't feel our joy. We don't feel able to be alive and to live our lives the way we wanted to live them when we began. We may even think that feelings, and in particular our feelings, are annoying encumbrances and inappropriate for a man. But let us not surrender our lives. Let us find the spontaneity and joy of life inside ourselves. Then not only will we live our lives more abundantly, but we will enable others to live perhaps for the first time in their lives.
When Lord of the Flies, William Golding's classic novel about English schoolboys marooned on a tropical island, was recently redone in cinematic form, critics of the new movie asked why the story had been remade. Even though this latest film version of Golding's story may not be the best cinema, the answer is that this work, in whatever form, speaks directly and powerfully about the human situation on this planet. It may be true that there never has been a time when the archetypes of the mature masculine were dominant in human life. It seems that we as a species live under the curse of infantilism, and maybe always have. Thus, patriarchy is really puerarchy, that is, the rule of boys. And perhaps our human world has always rather resembled Golding's Island. But at least there used to be structures and systems, rituals, for evoking a greater level of masculine maturity than seems to be the rule in our world today. At least there were at one time sacred kings, upon whom the men in the realm could project their inner king and thus activate this masculine energy form indirectly in themselves. Certainly, for both good and ill, there was a time when the warrior energy was active and effective in shaping the lives of men and the civilizations they built. And though always the prerogative of only a few, the magician was able to help individual men with their life problems and to gain for the society some control over the unpredictable world of nature. And the lover was also held in high regard in the cultures that celebrated seers and prophets, cave painters and poets. All that is changed now, cashed in for personal wealth and aggrandizement, the currency of the day. Yet ours is a world that needs the masculine energies in their maturity more urgently than ever in human history. It is a strange irony that at the very moment when all of civilization seems to be nearing its greatest initiation ever, from a fragmented tribal way of life to a more whole, more universal life, that just at this moment, the ritual processes for turning boys into men have all but disappeared from the planet. Just at the time when it is necessary for survival that immaturity be replaced by maturity, we are thrown back upon our own inner resources as men, struggling toward a wiser future for ourselves and our world pretty much alone. Maybe this is as it should be. The evolutionary process has placed the powerful resources of the four masculine archetypes within every man and has called upon them in different periods of human history to solve different problems and to dare the unthinkable, to organize laws out of chaos, to stimulate enormous outpourings of creativity and generativity like those that produced early civilizations, to gain some capacity to steward nature, both inner and outer, and to arouse tender appreciation and relatedness. Perhaps this growth process of our species has also arranged for the radical internalizing and psychologizing of these forces in modern men. If ours is an age of individualism in the deepest as well as in the most shallow sense, then let us be individuals. Let us nurture and welcome great individuals, individual men who will, with the benevolence of ancient kings, the courage and decisiveness of ancient warriors, the wisdom of magicians, and the passion of lovers, move energetically to take up the challenge of saving a world that has been cast down before us. There are certainly global needs and work enough to keep every man busy for the foreseeable future. Our effectiveness in meeting these challenges is directly related to how we as individual men meet the challenges of our own immaturity. How well we transform ourselves from men living our lives under the power of boy psychology to real men guided by the archetypes of man psychology will have a decisive effect on the outcome of our present world situation. 
We have briefly sketched the dimensions of the problem on these tapes. We have delineated the immature and the mature energy forms. We have shown something about how they interact with each other and how they give rise to each other in their shadow forms and in their fullness. In the time remaining, we'll look at some techniques for reconnecting appropriately with the archetypes of masculine maturity. The first step in doing this for each of us is critical self-appraisal. We have said that there is no use asking ourselves if the negative or shadow sides of the archetypes are showing up in our lives. The realistic, honest question we need to ask is how they are manifesting. Let us remember that the key to maturity, to moving from boy psychology to man psychology, is to become humble, to be grasped by humility. Let us recall that true humility consists of two things. The first is knowing our limitations, and the second is getting the help we need. Assuming that we could all use some help, we now look at three important techniques for accessing the positive resources we are missing in our lives. In the first of these techniques, called in psychology active imagination dialogue, the conscious ego enters into dialogue with various unconscious entities or other focused consciousnesses, other points of view within us. Behind these different points of view, sometimes in obscure ways, lie the archetypes in both their positive and in their negative forms. Active imagination dialogue is one important technique for holding conversations with these energy forms. In active imagination dialogue, we talk with them, contacting one or more of them and giving our point of view. Then we listen for their replies. Often, it is best to do this on paper, writing both the ego's thoughts and feelings and the opponent's thoughts and feelings just as they come without censoring them. This exercise may seem strange at first, but usually just a few moments of writing will reveal the reality of the other points of view within a man's psyche. One word of caution. If in the course of this exercise you encounter a really hostile presence, what some psychologists call an inner persecutor, stop the exercise and consult a good therapist. Most of us probably have inner persecutors as well as inner helpers, but the persecutor may be so vicious that you will need support to continue dialoguing with it. Often, conducting dialogue with inner opponents usually forms of the immature masculine energies, will diffuse much of their power. What they, like all children, really want is to be noticed, honored, and taken seriously. And they have a right to be. Once they are honored and their feelings validated, they no longer need to act out through our lives. A second technique we call invocation. This time, we access the masculine archetypes in their fullness as positive energy forms. If active imagination dialogue is a conscious, focused way of talking to yourself, invocation is a conscious, focused way of calling up the images you want to see. Imaging deeply affects our moods, our attitudes, the way we look at things, and what we do. It is therefore important what thoughts and images we are invoking in our lives. Here's how to do focused imaging or invocation. Find a quiet place and time. Clear your mind as best you can and relax. Focus on an image that has both mental pictures and spoken words, spoken in your head at least. It is useful to spend some time looking for images of the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover. Use those images in your invocations. During this exercise, set that image in front of you. As you relax, talk to the image. Call up the king inside yourself. Seek to merge your deep unconscious with him. In your imagination, 
make your ego his servant. What we are suggesting is comparable to what religions have always called prayer, when that prayer was accompanied by ritual accessing of the God. Along the same lines is the related technique of admiration. Mature men need to admire other men, living and dead. We need especially to have contact with older men whom we can look up to. If such men are not available to us personally, we need to read their biographies and become familiar with their words and deeds. These men need not be perfect, because perfection, the realization of the completely whole man, can never be achieved. Movement toward wholeness is possible, however, and every man is individually responsible for such movement. It is precisely at our weak points, at those places within our psyches where we are possessed by the poles of an archetypal shadow system that we need to invoke the strengths we lack but can appreciate in others. The point is that what images and thoughts we invoke determine to a large extent not only how things look to us, but how they actually are. A shift in our inner accessing of the archetypes of the mature masculine will effect a change in the outer circumstances of our lives. At the very least, a changed inner world will greatly enhance our capacity to deal with difficult circumstances and eventually turn them to better advantage for us, for those we love, and for our companies, our causes, and the world. Another technique for accessing the archetypes of the mature masculine relies on the time-validated technology of the actor trying to get into character. This technique we call acting as if. In this process, if you can't feel the character portrayed in your script, you begin by acting like the character would. You move and talk as this character would move and talk. You act as if. It's quite odd, but if you need to access more of the lover, for example, and sunsets don't interest you, go out and really look at a sunset. Act as if you appreciate it. Notice the colors. Force yourself to see the beauty. Pretty soon, strange as it may seem, you really may find yourself becoming interested in the sunset. A final word of encouragement. Any transformative process, like life itself, takes time and effort. We do our homework from the conscious side, and the unconscious, with its powerful resources, will, if approached in the right way, respond to our questions, our needs, and our woundedness in healing and generative ways. We wish to add our voices to those of the many men throughout history who, against enormous odds, have called for an end to the reign of the Lord of the Flies. If contemporary men can take the task of their initiation from boyhood to manhood as seriously as did their forebears, then we may witness the end of the beginning of our species instead of the beginning of the end. We may pass between the Scylla and Charybdis of our grandiosity and our chauvinistic tribalism and move beyond them into a future as wonderful and generative as any depicted in the myths and legends that the king, the warrior, the magician, and the lover have bequeathed to us.